Good morning, all. Good morning. Can I please ask people to sit down? Good morning. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to the annual PCI National Composite Center Conference. It's becoming a very good tradition that we'll be doing every year, uh, showcasing what we're all about, what we do. And to prove myself, a very warm welcome to all uh, attendees today. Uh, I believe that something close to 190 people have registered today. Uh, that includes 70 people from industry, and uh, in industry I don't include NCC. So it's, uh, it's a very, say, good representation of both academia and, and, uh, and industry. Let me see if I can get this to work. There we go. A few of, uh, a couple of, of, of practicalities. Fire safety. We haven't scheduled any, uh, any fire alarms organized today. So if it sounds, please leave the building by the nearest safe fire exit. There's one down there, I believe, and over there in the corner. Uh, make the way to the fire assembly point in the grass area behind the old courthouses and wait for further instruction. And you'll be in instructed what to do from there. The Wi-Fi, I think, I'll just bypass because, unfortunately, we've had a, a uh, basically a breakdown of the Wi-Fi systems here. So uh, it might come back on today at your room or you'll be guest, but uh, we can't offer Wi-Fi, unfortunately, now. So uh, hopefully that won't be too much of a problem. Yes, uh, so that's uh, that's uh, that's the cue. Uh, thank you, Mike. So of course, it could be some kind of intervention to suggest that you concentrate on what goes on here and not your emails. But uh, I shouldn't say that kind of thing. And toilets are located uh, next door in the in the breakout area. So, just a very brief overview. Welcome to me. I'll give a, a start by giving a little bit of an overview of PCI activity, followed by Matt Scott uh, from the National Composite Center. Uh, there's a few way of way following that. Uh, coffee break. Then we go into technical presentations with the focus you can see here on sustainable natural materials with speakers from, from both NCC and PCI, CCMCs for high temperature applications and future structures. We have lunch and networking activity for about an hour from 12.45. Then we have a, uh, a Alison Green from Vertical Aerospace has kindly agreed to do a plenary lecture for us, a keynote lecture, how compasses will help disrupt the future of, uh, the future of air travel. And uh, then we go on to the, uh, the afternoon, big afternoon thing about our panel session, compasses of the future, tomorrow's material, materials and applications. And Mike Hinton, HBMC, has kindly agreed to, uh, to chair that. And you can see the panelists here, Marcus Walsh-Brock from NCC, Alison Green, Vertical Aerospace, Faye Smith, Avalon, Lawrence Block from Lineat, uh, Jonathan Fuller from National Composite Center, Fabrizio Scarpa from Fabici, and, and, and John Megan from, from Solvay. So that's a program, and you uh, hopefully uh, it's going to be a very enjoyable and interesting and, and, and uh, instructive day for us all. So let me just get to the, uh, the brief overview of, of Bristol Composite Institute. Uh, you might, many of you are probably say well aware of our existence. I guess you are because you're here today. Uh, so, uh, just look at from the from the top side, uh, we are uh, uh, organized with two co-directors, Stephen Hallett and myself. Uh, we have uh, uh, organized ourselves internally, loosely in three themes. So, uh, uh, manufacturing design, structures and materials. It's a very loose organization. So, the idea is not to silo the activities going on. Uh, the, the three themes are largely of the same size uh, in terms of, of academics and students and so on. Our mission statement, you can see there. So that's the updated mission statement uh, that's come out of some work we've done internally and with the help also of, it, of, of Industrial Advisory Board on developing a new strategy for Bristol Compass Institute. And you can see now we, we, uh, we frame ourselves very much about the grand challenges of our time. So you can see our mission is to be a world-leading institute for compasses research and education and we're addressing the overall uh, overarching ch grand challenges, sustainability and net zero. 
So uh, under that, of course, there's a number of other qualifying themes that goes into that, and I'll, I'll go a little bit into that later on to see what lies in that. So facts about Bristol Compass Institute. So we are, we are now 32 academic staff members. Uh, so we have been so fortunate to be able to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to increase or to add uh, new, new uh, colleagues to, to BCI over the last couple of years. Uh, we have about 60 research associates, so postdocs, and, and about uh, 140 PhD and NHD students. We believe that we can claim to be world-leading fundamental composite research and education. So we, in many areas, we are really on, on, the, on the forefront. Uh, and we are very large compared to, to uh, competitors out there. Another thing we pride ourselves in, that we have very strong links with industry for exploitation and technology transfer. And if you look at the size of what we do on the research, uh, our, our, our current grant portfolio is about 25 million pounds, which has been fairly constant over the, over the last few years. So it's a sizable piece of, uh, piece of activity that we, we have in BCI. Here's kind of an overview, which is very busy, of the activities in, in BCI, uh, the key activities. And I'm not gonna go through all of it in detail because you can see there are many, many facets to what we do in BCI. Uh, uh, a, few, a few highlights could be, we have very well established industry partnerships. This includes that we are hosting a Rolls-Royce University State Technology Center for Composites. We, uh, we also are hosting a Windblade Research Hub so we are active in that area as well. We have an extremely strong partnership and collaboration with our with National Composite Center over many years, so that's a, that's a strength. And we have, say, more than 40 companies on and off are now engaged in, uh, directly engaged with BCI research. Of course, we also are involved in training and education. So this involves a, a industrial doctorate center in composite manufacturing and also a center of doctorate training uh, uh, funded by the EPSRC as well, so it's currently the, the COSM CDT. We are also running a, an MSc in composites, advanced composites, and of course we do a standard PhD as well. If you go the other way around facilities, we, we believe that we have world-class labs to conduct our research uh, for whatever, uh, say, methodologies and techniques are, are needed for doing that. We have a very wide engagement with composite community. Uh, this includes workshops and seminars. Today is an example of how we engage. We also uh, uh, organize uh, special sessions at academic conferences. We have many relationships also with, uh, with smaller companies, uh, SMEs, and uh, we, we have a close work into deliver technology innovation as well, as, as you'll see in a minute. Our academic research portfolio I've already mentioned, so we have an, a, a large number of, of grants from the EPSRC large and small, this includes also, uh, we, are, we are a key partner in the, uh, in the EPSRC Simcom Manufacturing Hub. Large number of, we are, we are currently involved in three program grants, which are kind of the, the biggest, uh, some of the biggest uh, instruments, funding instruments from the EPSRC. Several EU projects and looking to expand that because fortunately from our point of view, uh, Britain has, has confirmed its, its participation in European research programs, which is very important for us. And we also have dual degree offerings with a number of institutions and cut arrangements with a number of uh, academic institutions around the world in Europe. So, and of course, not to forget, we're also very active in, in public outreach. To, to, uh, to evidence or evidence for the, for the spirit of innovation that we have here also, uh, BCI, I'm proud to say, has been basically the basis for a number of innovative spin-offs or spin-outs, uh, so companies coming out of our CDT, so actually PhD training programs with individuals with very good ideas and joining up with researchers with very good ideas and coming out. So Ecomat, uh, tow sharing technology, Lineat, aligned short fiber composites, uh, so we, uh, we're using reclaimed fi carbon fiber, Molydin, uh, which is, like, uh, is, 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 is basically uh, 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 molecular dynamic simulations in, in, uh, in a new framework, an actuation lab, which is basically founded uh, to, uh, to read industries of outdated hardware using origami technology. All of those are, are expanding, doing well, and, and, uh, and, and uh, developing on, on their own. But of course, with input and contacts back to BCI as well. Just a few words about our industrial doctor center, the RDIDC. 
So uh, 31 students have graduated from that. And we have 20 at various stages uh, in their studies. So overall, more than 50 have gone to that. Seven students in uh, studentships are on their way. Have been or have, have been uh, recruited by by NCC this year, with three more for next year. We are still seeking more industrial partners for this. So uh, if you're interested, please don't hesitate to come back to us, and and uh, we are very interested to talk to you, and set up our projects in that. The plan is to grow the RDC with the support of uh, of more industrial partners, as said. So uh, there's a little brochure in the pack that you have seen today where you can fi find more information about this. We have recently had a, a very successful showcase event in, in earlier this year down in Bristol. And uh, we have also developed a new program for professional and, uh, uh, and, and personal development of, uh, of for our students and with very much with the support of our industrial partners. Our, our CDT uh, Center for Doctoral Training uh, basically, we've come to the, to the point now where we, we have started the last cohort. Uh, so all five cohorts have re been recruited. Uh, it's the uh, composites, uh, it's a center of doctoral training uh, in, in uh, composite design, engineering, and manufacturing, known among friends as COSEM. Uh, there will be 52 students in COSEM in the city in total. And uh, we want, of course, to thank all the industrial partners that have been uh, basically uh, bidding into this and, and engaging financially to support the students in this. And we are still in, uh, very interested in engaging with industry, so in industrial visits, uh, uh, seminars, and so on. So please, anybody from industry here interested in, 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 in knowing more about that or engaging with that, please don't hesitate to come back to us. The final cohort just started this year, this September this year, so 11 students, CDT 2023, and uh, they're now doing their, their taught, their taught uh, element in the first year, taught courses. They're going to choose their projects for the end of year one and often leading into the, to the research project. So uh, we are still very interested to connect with, with industry that would be interested to support that area. If you have very some, some pressing research or strategic needs that you need to, to explore, there's a conversation to be had there. So please don't hesitate to come back to us. And as a, as a very happy thing, the first COSM CT student has recently submitted a PhD thesis. So it's coming now to, this, to the cycle where the first students intake, which was like four years ago, they've now submitted a thesis so we can see actually well it's, it's delivering as, as, as planned. So that was about that. Just a few words about the, uh, the future research strategy. So I told you already that we have been through a process of defining a new strategy for BCI. Uh, over the last uh, uh, months, starting at the beginning of the year. Uh, and and uh, I mentioned that net zero and sustainability were key challenges we want to address in that. But of course, there are some qualifiers underneath those titles, and the sustainability is a key part of it. A lot of the projects we, we, we do, or I will say all of them, have it somewhere embedded as part of that, even if it may not be the main theme, sustainability is like a cross-cutting theme for everything. Net zero, where we're doing activity in hydrogen storage, light weighting, renewable energy and all materials and so on. So a lot of, 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 of particular research in that. Digital technology across, uh, uh, say, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the basically the, the, uh, the challenges for composites. So advanced numerical tools for integration of manufacturing and design optimized to contribute to net, net zero. So obviously that's, we know very well that that's a, a massive agenda also in industry. And, and we, are, we are there. Finally, materials in extreme environments is something that we are increasingly coming into as well. So nuclear defense and so on, and it's composites, but it's not just polymer-based composites, it's also ceramics and so on. So a, a growth area as well. So this, in a snapshot, kind of defines uh, the focus areas for, for, for BCI. So what we say, we want to deliver inherently sustainable composite solutions for the benefit of society and the global community. So that's the ambition. And this is a, a pictogram. I'm not going to take you through all the details of it, but it shows how you can engage with BCI. Come and work with us is the general uh, encouragement. So you can see here, you can uh, spin out uh, small projects, starting off with student projects perhaps, leading on to bigger, bigger jobs or bigger research areas. 
uh, undergraduate, master's programs, PhD, and, and larger research funding, uh, re research activities together, joint uh, activities, and so on. So that brings me to the end of, of my talk, and uh, I'll hand over to Matt from, uh, from the NCC. Over to you. Thanks, Oli. Uh, really nice to welcome you here this morning um, in Bristol. Um, so my name is Matt Scott. I'm the uh, Chief Engineer for Capability at the NCC. And one of my main roles uh, at the NCC is to provide a really strong interface uh, with the Bristol Composites Institute and perhaps the wider University of Bristol as well. Um, and I thought I'd take this opportunity for a few minutes just to talk to you a little bit about first of all, who the NCC is, although I imagine many of you will know who we are and what we do, but also how we're working ever closer together with the University of Bristol, how we try to play on each other's strengths, and the frameworks within which we operate in order to create a real impact on society and industry at large. So that's what I'll be talking about this morning. Um, okay, so zooming out a long, long way to what the composites industry means across the UK. Uh, these are figures that came from the uh, Lucentel report in 2020. Um, so figures are a little bit old now, but 400 companies across the UK uh, in the supply chain employing 30,000 people. So composites is actually quite a big deal in the UK. Uh, it's highly technology intensive, which is great for us because we're working in technology. Um, and that means it's a high value industry, valuing 4 billion in 2019. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it has an impact on the UK that is significant and uh, important. What, do the, it does, what does the industry face? It's an engineering industry. It faces all the same challenges that many other industries face. So we've got cost, um, the, the impact of um, product value, you know, trying to decrease manufacturing cost, materials cost, product cost into, into, into a market. Time to market, particularly when you're developing a new product, how can you reduce the time it takes? Waste, you know, reducing waste, trying to make sure that we can save money, um, save um, the impact on the environment as well at the bottom there, so environmental impact. And what are we trying to increase? We're trying to increase design flexibility. Um, we're trying to increase rates. We're trying to increase quality of the parts that we manufacture. And we're looking for new solutions, so um, new ideas that are going to go to impact um, society and uh, the country and the world at large in a positive way. How do we attack those challenges? Um, what do we do to do about them? Well, we, in our case, we are looking at new technologies, new ideas, or exi indeed development of existing ideas. Um, and these are some of the really sort of important levers and technologies that we can use to, to do that. Um, Oli Oli's already mentioned the, the grand challenges of our time. We've got sustainability, we've got net zero, we've got some really interesting things uh, happening in the defense space and security at the moment, that which we need to respond to as a composites community in order to, to have a positive impact. So you can see these are all new things, and, and, and the, the hydrogen economy, the top right there, new energy vectors. These are things that we're going to have to respond to and use um, to make a difference. Um, when the NCC was set up 12, 13, 14 years ago, um, we were very much set on this sort of middle of the TRL spectrum. So technology readiness level um, charts the um, progress of ideas through into impact. And the NCC activity is really in that valley of death. You're probably familiar with that term. Um, taking ideas out of um, sort of the very risky space over here through into something that which is making a really big impact um, with reduced risk and increased um, impact in the world. We were involved in that middle of that stage. Um, and at a glance, uh, I've got another one of these numbers slides, so I won't, s I won't mention every single number. Uh, that's that's who we are at the NCC over in uh, Emerson's Green principally, but we also have a site in Filton as well. Um, we have over 300 specialist engineers working across the engineering cycle, um, 40 million pound turnover, um, very significant investment in equipment and capabilities and hardware, which are able to demonstrate uh, manufacturing at, um, at reasonable rate of, of, of new solutions. Um, we've got a very large um, industry footprint, 70 members uh, and eight major sectors supported. Um, and of those sectors, um, aerospace, defense, space, energy, construction, bare automotive, marine, medical devices, and sports and leisure, perhaps in the future as well. So we're already working in these sectors, but we're, we're hoping to increase that uh, going forwards. And 
we're working across the the full um, engineering V um, within composites, uh, and indeed wider than that often as well. So understanding what our market drivers are, through to concepting a new solution, determining what requirements are going to be, detailed design, manufacturing implementation, and that's where we re really rely on a lot of that hardware that I talked about earlier. How do we um, manufacture at rate and at cost? Uh, testing and validation, operation as well. So how can we best support and extend the life cycle of product in, in operation? Maintenance and repair uh, and retirement. And of course, verification and validation as well. So uh, across the full engineering V, the NCC has some kind of offering into industry. Um, across design, develop and deliver. And here you can see some of that equipment that I mentioned. So just this is just some of it. We've got the automated preforming cell. So this is a very general purpose robotic cell with a KUKA robot. We've got our braider, um, which is the largest of its kind in the UK. Uh, it's two rings, um, 192 carriers on the outside ring um, to develop to, to braid very large closed uh, s structures. We've got our overmolder, um, which can produce very um, high tack time parts. Um, with thermoplastics. We've also got a range of presses as well, which aren't um, in any of these pictures. Um, automated fiber placement. We've got, uh, well, actually, we've just lost one of our automated fiber placement machines. We've only got three now, so we're having to make do, really scraping the barrel. But um, <laughs> yeah, so lots of uh, automated fiber placement across the, the NCC. Also, also automated tape laying. Uh, this is our ultrasonic kit, so able to um, obviously and detect defects and composite parts. And finally, this is one of our um, sort of highest profile pieces of kit, working with aerospace customers around development of very large products, uh, a very high deposition rate. And they, there's an AFP head on there as well as a range of sort of novel composite manufacturing techniques, which have developed a lot over the last few years. So significant investment into equipment and capability. And these are some of the large pieces of kit. We also have, I suppose, the, the bread and butter, the really sort of get the job done um, at the right scale, the right time, the right pace as well. So infusion capability, RTM capability, um, pre-preg layup capability. Um, we're able to scale our sort of solutions to a range of customers, large and small, in order to um, deliver on, on uh, what we need to deliver. Um, so I mentioned that we're sort of operating in the middle of this TRL chain. Um, it's not quite true, this is probably a vast simpl simplification, but you can I imagine this TRL scale as a little bit like a technology supply chain. So you've got um, Bristol Composites Institute, or indeed the wider University of Bristol, or indeed um, academia at large in the UK, um, working on ideas and technologies at a low TRL, um, you know, proving out basic principles in the laboratory across TRL 3. At TRL 3 and 4, that's when the NCC really starts to pay attention and become interested because we want to make an impact, we want to use this technology to create a difference. And so what we're doing through a number of mechanisms, which I'll talk about um, in a few slides time, we're then transferring a lot of this technology um, up into the higher TRLs, and then we're delivering for industry. So we're, we're pulling across this, this part of the TRL scale, and then what we want uh, industry to do is to help to pull on us at uh, this part of the TRL scale as well. So to pull that technology which we've in that hopefully validated and, and shown to be to be worth um, while pursuing, and then take it into um, application um, and changing things. Um, it's worth very quickly touching on sort of the 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 time that we're at in the UK. We're at a bit of an inflection point um, where there has been significant funding, particularly in Bristol, but across the UK, that's been invested into composites R and D uh, in in academia. Um, for the last 14 plus years. Um, that's really supported, it's energized low TRL composites research ecosystem. So we've got things like the CDTs, continual chain of CDTs at the University of Bristol in composites. Uh, we've had the IDC more recently. We've had the um, composites manufacturing research hubs as well, two iterations of that, which have br really br brought together the ac academics across the UK uh, around composites. Now the, the funding periods for, oh many of those opportunities are drawing to a close. Um, they've had great impact, but we need them to carry on if we're going to achieve that same level of impact. We've already shown how there's vast challenges which we need to um, sort of tackle over the course of the next decades, 20, 30 years. Um, and we're going to need really significant investment into low TRL composites development 
if we're going to benefit from that in 10, 15, 20 years' time. So it's really important that, um, <laughs> that those bids pay off. Um, we're supporting them as the NCC as best as we can, or, or because although we're not direct beneficiaries, you know, we're not we're not being paid um, out of those tho out of that EPSRC funding, but we are beneficiaries of the technology that's developed out of the back of it. So really, really important. Um, and, and we don't really need to look back over the last few years to see some of the impact that this funding has had. So um, Oli's already mentioned four of the um, of the startups that have come out of BCI, and I've got a um, two here, Icomat and Lineat. Icomat we're working really closely with, in fact, working with both of them um, in their toe shearing technology, and Lineat in their sort of short fiber um, tape as well. Um, Phil Druff is who's presenting later. Um, he'll talk a little bit about um, I think I think you're talking about that, aren't you, Phil? You're not talking about the other project? Yeah, yeah, he's got thumbs up. So he's going to be talking a little bit about how we brought Icomat and Lineat together on one of the NTC's core projects to show how um, sort of automated deposition with Icomat um, can really show the benefits of the flexibility and formability of the Lineat material. So, um, yeah, quite exciting work, and it's continuing into another year. We've got some really interesting industrial sponsors this year, um, so um, do keep an eye out for... Uh, Phil's presentation a little bit later this morning. Um, I thought I have some more slides, but clearly not. Um, I think I can leave it there. I've lost my train of thought now. Um, what I do hope is that, though is that you uh, enjoy the presentations this morning, that uh, you learn something from them, um, that some of the sort of um, ways in which the NCC and BCI are working, either together in collaboration or in parallel, um, shows something of the, the strength of that relationship um, and hopefully is going to make a, a, a difference in, in years to come. So thank you very much. So we're, we're well, we're well ahead, ahead of time, uh, it was uh, very unusual, uh, but uh, uh, there's time for questions if uh, anybody's got some questions, comments. Mike, yes, thank you. To start things off, um, so good morning, everybody. First of all, Mike Hinton. Um, perhaps just to prompt uh, Matt, particularly just as a start of a ten, you might want to talk about technology pull-through program in the space that we've got available. And I'll hand back to you and leave that with you for a second. Thank you, Mike. So, yeah, that was that was one of the slides that I must have missed off of the original pack. Um, technology pull-through is is where we're engaging at this lower tier end of the TRL scale. Um, it's one of our flagship programs. Um, it's um, one of the ways that we, we take our um, some of the in internal money that the NCC is given from government and we say we want to invest really strongly in some of the most promising and exciting research that comes out of academia. So we actually have a call open now, um, which is closing tomorrow evening. Um, but if you go to the NCC website and you look for um, sort of how we work with academia, sort of do a Google search across the NCC website, you'll come across the technology pull through program. Um, we do a sort of filter of some of the applications that we get. We try and pick out on the, the, the most impactful, what we believe to be the most impactful projects um, that are going to, going to have an effect over the next few years and the projects which the NCC is able to apply its own capabilities to support that technology. Um, what it's not is it's not the NCC taking work away from academicians. In fact, what, it, what I hope it does is it provides, you know, these a lot of these um, ideas and technologies, they progress up through this TRL period um, scale a bit like a pyramid so you end up with you know increased work hi t higher TRL scales but the fundamentals and some of the more intricate ele elements of that technology still need progressing at academia as level as well so yeah, really really important program um, I, th I suppose some of the other things some of the other mechanisms that we're, we're collaborating with with academia and particularly BCI on are things like our uh, eng engineering doctorate scheme so Oli mentioned the IDC earlier um, we have I think it's 11 or 12 or 13 um, NGDs at, at the NCC at the moment. We took on a large number this year. Um, and yeah, we think that's really important as well. Now, some of those NGDs are, are, are focused on technology pull-through programs, the ones that I mentioned just now. Some of them are on our core program, the one that Phil, um, family, same family that Phil will be talking a little bit later about. Some of them are assigned to our collaborative R&D programs as well. So we really try and use those engineering doctorates to support um, the fundamental um, research 
in those you know funded programs and things that we're gonna we know are gonna change the world. So um, yeah, thanks, Mike, for the question. Hello. Yeah, I think it is. Um, I can speak loud anyway. Um, so um, it's really good to see so many people here from industry and colleagues as well, and that's great. Um, Matt's been talking about our um, our industrial doctorate centre and the NGDs that we've got at NCC. We'd like to see more of our NGD students um, located in industry or more NGD students located in industry. So as Oli mentioned, in your pack, there's a very nice flyer telling you about why, why you might want to support an NGD student. You can see it's, it's at the back of your package. I put my one at the front, okay? Um, <laughs> so if you... Um, if, if you're interested in in um, in supporting an NGD student, there's a f there's a few things that aren't on that leaflet with about the financials and so on. So please come and have a chat with me at the in the tea breaks and at, at lunchtime, and I'll be happy to discuss this with you further. So I just thought I'd make that um, announcement. Uh, Any more questions? Oh yeah, Chris. Right, right in the middle here. Yeah, I'll repeat. I'll repeat your question. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, great question. So that funding, um, the IDC comes to an end. I think technically it's it's already come to an end. Uh, we're on the tail end of the IDC funding. The CDT. I was just speaking with Stephen earlier. Um, they've taken their last cohort of students this year, so they've got another four years for those students to pass through the system. Um, the hub is coming to an end in the springtime next year. Um, Surgeon stuff. Um, the bids are already in, so um, the teams, the, the academic teams principally, although the NCC has helped, have gone out to industry to gather support, letters of support and commitments for, fu for funding um, where appropriate. Um, so those bids are already in, however, any support that you're able to continue um, offering will always be welcome. So if that's something you'd like to do, you know, if that's something that you're, you, you in industry would benefit from in terms of in the future or even now, in, you know, you've got a specific research challenge that you think perhaps a, uh, a PhD or an NGD um, would support you on, then please do speak with Janice um, or with Stephen or, or, or anyone, you know, anyone who's, who's working in that space. They've both got their hands up. Just to talk about the, um, the the CDT bid briefly, um, thanks very much to all the um, 28 industrial partners that are, that are supporting our CDT bid. Um, doesn't mean that if you're um, if you if you're not joined with us, you can't join. We're we're, we're always welcoming um, other other industries to come and su come and join this partnership. We'll find out whether we've been successful on the 6th of of December. So I think it was just appropriate to say thanks to everybody for being absolutely fantastic and supporting that. Um. Yeah, I, I, I was going to ask a question, actually. Um, so you good that you've got the slide up here. You've got Composites Institute, National Composite Centre. OK, you've got UK academia, if you like. Let's broaden it out. National Composite Centre and industry. And you did sort of make a passing mention to government so I just wonder what role does NCC play in lobbying towards government? Because obviously we're talking about funding, things coming forward. You know, how, how, how does that work from an NCC perspective? Yeah, good question. So we are, this is ties into Mike's point really nicely as well, um, with the HPMC. So we're a, we're a high volume manufacturing catapult center, one of seven centers in the UK who are focused on developing um, high value manufacturing uh, particularly in this Valley of Death region. So um, we have one line in, direct line into Innovate UK through the high value manufacturing catapult and into, into government through that. We are able to, through a number of other fora in the composites arena, to um, uh, input into government as well. Particularly important around sort of some of the grand challenges. I, I can see Faye, you, would you like to say something? Uh, 
Thanks. We've got the um, the Composites, Composites UK, NCC, Simcomp, and, and the Institute of Materials are all, all form the board of the Composites Leadership Forum. And they are at the moment, <coughs> excuse me, working to um, create new lines into the new structure within governments because since um, DIT and Bayes became DBT, there's been restructures and we've got DSIT and all the rest of it. Um, we had a meeting a couple of weeks ago where we mapped everything out. We have an agreement from a lady from DBT. She will be joining the CLF board meeting in due course um, to talk through her plans to support this sector and listen to our plans about what this sector needs. Um, there's also, we've created within the new structure of government, there's now a cross-cutting, cross-Whitehall materials group where the last meeting had about 25 people on there from all different departments of anyone interested in materials. Um, I'm looking at the next one in December to get them to look at decarbonisation and LCA because they are not coordinating across departments and the composite sector has got real problems as a result of that. So I'm not bringing, it up, I'm not bringing that up from a composites perspective, I'm bringing that up from a materials perspective, but I'll use the problems within the composite sector to highlight some of the issues that we've got because they're not talking across the different sectors. So we are, we, we have got lines in. I won't say they're easy and I have to be careful because I do have one foot in the camp and one foot out of the camp. Um, but, but yeah, there are challenges, but we are trying to find ways to get the right messages through. Does that help? I'm joining the, oh, sorry. Um, can, can I just finish up the point for Steve, if oh, you don't mind? sorry, yeah, sure. Um, forgive me. Um, Steve, uh, and for, for all in the audience, just build on Faye's point, because, um, you know, we're in a room here with people who are here because we're passionate about composites. I mean, that's obvious. obvious. Um, if you come up another level, we're all passionate about materials as well. And actually, the thing that we've been battling at for quite a while now, uh, a number of us in this room, Faye, myself, and, and a few others, we had an attempt to try and develop a national materials strategy through a thing called the Advanced Material Materials Leadership Council uh, that didn't succeed. Um, for the reasons that Faye has just outlined, we're continuing to push to try to get a national strategy and a plan off the ground. Um, so whilst there is the cross-departmental government um, activities going on that Faye has described, we've also got an initiative which is putting together a materials leadership group, um, which is chaired by Alan Cook, who was formerly chair of HS2 and chair of the HVM Catapult Exec Board. Um, it's being sponsored effectively by, the, by Royce, uh, it's got the chief scientific advisor from DBT on it, and that's just in the mode at the, m at the minute of putting together the working groups to try to pull together what should our national material strategy look like, and more relevantly, what's the plan that we're going to put in place to deliver against it, which comes down to what are the interventions that we need to make. Okay, so that's what's going on at a, at a strategic level. As Faye has said, it's by no means easy. And within that tent of national materials strategy, where we think the composites community's got an argument to make, and it has, we're also wrestling with, do we have a steel industry? And you've seen all of that in the press. What can we do about aluminium, where we're in, we import everything at the moment? Um, yeah, and what do we do about critical minerals? So we've got to stand our corner in that whole debate, you know, and come to a balanced view because the government's got not got infinite amount of money, and neither does industry. So we've got to pick our winners. So I'll stop there because that's a there's a, a lot going on. Will it all land with a joined up activity? I hope, but reason tells me no. Can we get a few things that start to stand up as sensible? Uh, pillars, as it were, that we can build from? I think yes. Let me stop there because I don't mean to lecture you. But that's the answer to your, your question, Steve. Okay. 
you very much, Mark, and thank you very much for everybody with their, their, their input to this discussion. Just one final thing. There was a question about what's after the CDT. It's coming to an end, and, and uh, the, the, the other part of that is the what's, what's after the Simcom Manufacturing Hub, and, and there's been a similar process around that, a process with, uh, with expressions of interest, and there was a bid from what will be Simcom 3. It's, uh, it's a full proposal was submitted. We expect to be uh, interviewed for a bar panel in the, on the 12th of February next year, and we'll know then if it comes true or not, uh, sometime probably in March, uh, I, would, I would assume, to be able to start by July next year. So our, 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 our hopes are, of course, that we will continue that with a, with a new basic branding and, 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 new, and new, new fresh thoughts about what that would look like. So hopefully we can carry on with, with that and bring also the CDC together with NCC and all that. So that excellent collaboration that's been basically developing over years, hopefully can go into and become ev even stronger for the benefit of, of, uh, of, of UK economy and, and society, of course. There's a question over here. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. It was very informative session, especially I'm joining BCI in two months time. So it's kind of giving an overview. I have two questions. One is, um, like, I'm coming from academia, and I work, for example, in fields besides hydrogen storage. We are also working on agrochemical delivery, for example, and I didn't see anything related to agriculture, which is coming as a hot topic, like government is um, gets boosting of funding in sustainable agriculture. So is it intentionally not there, or is it just happened not to be there? So that's one question, um, and the other one is like, because of my background in academia, so NCC is kind of sitting bes uh, between academia and industry. Um, is there a mechanism, for example, um, staff members who are not familiar or doesn't have a direct contact with some, some industrial partner, so is there a mechanism to support that or catalyze that kind of uh, interaction between academia and uh, industry? Should uh, is there is there a process where we should approach and and seek support to facilitate that? Uh, okay, so I'll I'll I'll, ta I'll target the first question first. Uh, my father-in-law works in agriculture, so yes, that's definitely a priority. <laughs> uh, I'd be in trouble if I said it wasn't a priority. Um, it w it would come. I don't think this slide was put together a little while ag a little while ago, but it would come under the title of off highway. And we're also looking at construction, uh, you know, sort of off-highway um, land, land uh, vehicles. So, yeah, uh, important. Um, and it's definitely uh, an area that perhaps we haven't had lots of work on in the past at the NCC, but uh, I would hope that grows going forwards. Um, Mike, do you, want to, do you want to talk again? Bit of a, bit of a dumping of information since you've asked the question. So, come out one in terms of agri-tech, first of all. Um, the there are already ex existing agri-tech centres that currently are funded through DBSRC, one of the research councils. Those agri-tech cent centres are being agglomerated and almost certainly going to become a new part of the catapult network. Okay, so those agri-tech centres will be particularly, I guess, supercharged to make sure that the connectivity across the supply chain supply base is, is more effective than it is currently. Um, with respect to this, this today's session and composite, in a way your question, I think you didn't quite phrase it, was what part does composites play in agri-tech? That I think is what you were asking. And um, you know, why is it not on the chart here at the moment? Because I, I think number one, there are other players in the area. Number two, most of the issues around agri-tech I shouldn't say most of the issues. <laughs> it divides out. There's an awful lot about digitalization and what do you do with information? What do you do with autonomy in particular? Um, and when it comes down to where composites f can make a, a, a difference, it, I hesitate to say second order, but it sort of is compared to what the agri-tech centers and what our nation is trying to struggle with at the moment. So it's certainly something that I, I know across the, the HVM catapult, we've got a number of activities involved particularly digitalization and, and autonomy. Um, probably less so in the structural aspects at the moment because that's not where the focus is. And we can't cover everything. 
So what we're concentrating on at the moment through government policy is really the areas that we can make the most difference in. So you're not going to see a list with everything on it because that wouldn't be reasonable. And we can talk offline about Agritech if you over the tea break if you wish. Hope that helps. Simon? Yeah, so I, I was just going to pick up that second question with you on the interaction with uh, academia and industry in this. So I'm Simon Quinn, so I'm in that engagement role within BCI, basically as Matt Soppo to link the BCI up with the NCC and external partners. I also have a role as business development with the Simcom hub, and so I'll just pick that up as an example, actually. Um, obviously, it comes to the end of the big block of funding, year six out of seven, so the research funding is committed for that program. There's a new bid in. But the point I want to make is actually if industry or partners want to work with that, in, 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 in it's a current group of 16 UK, you know, UK universities on composites manufacturing, just talk to us because the other important bit of this is that beyond the EPSERC investment and the work that got done within the hub, there was 20 million pounds of leverage funding on other projects. Industry just wanted to work with a hub partner and they went straight into an Innovate UK bid, for example. So I think the, the message is just come and talk to us. And, and I'm one of the people you can do that with and we will join the dots. Thank you very much, Simon, Mike, everybody. Any more comments? There's one down here. We have a few more minutes. Good morning, everybody. Um, so could you just go back to the TRL slide again? Because uh, I've been sat kind of thinking on this, and it's, it's kind of lining up with some stuff that we're, we're trying to work through um, within Solvay, where, uh, where I work. I think this is a really great slide, but it's obviously kind of simplified a lot for visualization purposes. And the, the reality is that industry is more complex than being just one block. And the o there's overlaps kind of up and down that TRL scale between academia, RTOs, and industry. I was wondering if there's room for um, for a, uh, a scope kind of within the BCI or within the NCC and things to try and decomplexify the areas where there is overlap. Because I think we can all agree that overlap is great. We can discuss in the areas that we all overlap in. But sometimes it can actually get in the way of things progressing and being pulled from a low TRL to a high TRL. Um, and, you know, what works now works, but is there a way of optimising how it's working to kind of, you know, get the most benefit for the UK or the global composites economy out of what's going on already? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so the national plan, okay, yeah. I think you've got a good, good, good point there, but I think uh, the, the way to, to promote that is to keep the discussion flowing. And have those, those those conversations, and the backbone would be the national plan. And even what, what did you say, Mike? Even if we don't get there, we could perhaps do some sensible some in in between. Okay, we are coming to the end of the session, and I thought we were we had lots of time left, but we don't actually. So it's been a good discussion. Thank you very much. We have a tea break now, or for those who want coffee, like myself, that will be coffee as well. And then we uh, we rejoin in here at eleven o'clock. Okay, so let's make a start. So welcome to this session, se second session for the NCC BCI uh, Joint Annual Conference. So we're now going to uh, embark on a, a series of uh, much more technical um, presentations uh, from a, a series of speakers um, between NCC and uh, BCI. We've got three um, themed sub-sections -se -se to this um, session. Uh, the first is on uh, sustainable and natural materials. Uh, the second will be uh, looking at uh, CMC, ceramic matrix composites, um, which are a uh, growing, uh, growing area of, of uh, work in high temperature applications. And then um, sort of more uh, futuristic use of composites in uh, advanced um, structure, structural applications. 
So, so to kick off the uh, sustainable and natural uh, material session, um, we have uh, Susie Morton and Hannah Swindon from the NCC. Over to you. Good morning, everyone. How are we doing? Um, so first off, my, my name is Susie Morton. I'm from the National Composite Centre. I'm a research engineer in the high volume manufacturing team there. And I'm Hannah Swinburne. I'm also a research engineer, and I am in our sector team of emerging markets and surface transport. So we'd like to say a quick thank you to Joe and the team for organizing and for having us here today. We're going to be chatting to you a bit about the industrial processing of biocomposites and some of the opportunities and challenges that we found during a case study that we'll go into a bit more detail on. So to start a bit on the why um, of why we're looking into biocomposites. So in a recent, recent report that we released with the Royal Society of Chemistry, we highlighted that in 2019, we made 110,000 tons of composites in the UK, but only 6% of these actually went into reuse applications. So to us, that really highlights the fact that we aren't designing our composites or, um, or handling them in the right way. Um, also, on top of that, our legacy materials of carbon and glass fiber um, have high embedded carbon, um, and we are creating a large amount of glass fiber composites, which in a lot of the applications we're seeing um, don't have the technical value at end of life to go into recycling often. So this is where biocomposites um, offer quite an interesting solution to that. We're also aware from speaking to the companies that we work with that there are some challenges with the adoption of these biocomposites. So what we did was interview uh, 36 of these companies, cross-sector um, <coughs> aerospace, um, construction, automotive, etc. Um, and we picked out the three main challenges to them in the technical use of biocomposites. And these were a lack of mechanical and environmental performance data, um, a lack of understanding of how to process these composites to the same quality as our legacy materials, um, and finally, a perceived high cost. So to give you an idea of some of the stuff that we've done at the NCC already with biocomposites and natural fibres, if you look at the image on the left, this is a flax fibre infused uh, wheelchair seat pan. In the middle, um, we've got an example of some of our overbraider working, um, so with flax, and then we've got a basalt inner there. And then this image on the right here is um, what we focused on for this case study using injection overmoulding, which we'll go into a wee bit more in a minute. We've missed it. We've got a slide missing. Do you want to give a overview? Oh, yes. So is that just the one slide? <laughs> <laughs> so um, to give you a bit of an idea, the, um, the next, what, the case study, just a bit of a background on the case study is we've got what we hope is a UK first in injection overmoulding of biocomposites, so a flax fibre PLA. Um, this is looking to assess the kind of processability and understand kind of the performance of these biocomposites whilst using a high volume um, processing technique that can be used in industry. Have I missed out bits? Probably. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Um, so we've gone about this um, by first doing a requirements capture, focusing on the automotive industry. Um, we've done a materials selection to understand what materials are most suitable um, in the circular economy um, for overmoulding at the moment. Um, we've also done mechanical and environmental testing um, and Throughout all of this, we've done a life cycle assessment. So we're going to go a bit deeper into each of those work packages now. Um, so we're aware that in the space of biocomposites, there's a lot of space for greenwashing. Um, so what we did in this material selection was use the Ellen MacArthur circular economy model as a sort of basis of um, looking at sustainable materials. So we know that there is space for technical and biocomposites in the future. We're not trying to claim that all carbon fibre is about to become flax. Um, so we've approached this first looking at um, technical materials and understanding that we need to be retaining their value in the economy through reuse, um, repair and recycle. And my colleague Kyle is going to go a bit more into what we're doing on recycling later. Um, and in the biocomposite sphere, we need to be understanding how we can not just take these materials from the biosphere, but um, compost them and use them to regenerate natural systems. So um, overmoulding is a thermoplastic process, um, and in our technical materials, we wanted to use and select a material that is familiar to our automotive customers. So we've looked at a glass fibre polypropylene, and then in our biosphere space, we've selected 
really what we found was the only available um, compostable thermoplastic um, composite materials in the format we needed for overmolding, um, which was flax fibre and PLA. And um, we also, throughout this project, learned the importance of communicating with material suppliers um, and feeding back our learnings to them on processing. So we work with AD Majoris and Lanxess. Um, and we also work with our um, sister centre, WMG, to understand processing. And what's coming up for us next after this, we really want to understand that end of life, so potentially shredding and reprocessing thermoplastics and actually composting um, flax PLA. So if you want to know more, catch us after. So for those of you maybe who are a bit less familiar with injection overmolding, um, to put it into context of the automotive industry, they're looking to create parts in under 10 minutes. They've got really high repeatability. And then you can also incorporate a level of kind of complexity into your geometry as well. So if we look at this image on the right, that kind of black section at the back is the, sort of the compression molded technical continuous fiber section. And then the more detailed features are the injection overmold here. So you can, that's where you can incorporate the complexity and potentially even inserts, additional inserts that may be useful for your component. So uh, to look at our, what we found from our processing was that between the two materials, we actually had very similar processing parameters. So the temperatures and pressures were reasonably similar. However, the flax PLA benefited from a bit longer in the cooling cycle. Um, and for both materials, tool hygiene was highly important, although more so for our flax PLA. To move on to the next step, so after processing, we were doing some in-house verification. So we've got a very capable team in-house. Um, prior to manufacturing, we were looking at the tensile and flexural properties of both materials. We found that the flax PLA, you're maybe not surprised, was less than a third of those of the glass polyprop in terms of performance. Um, so this really indicates to us that clever design um, decisions have to be made when you're looking at incorporating these materials into applications. So prior to processing, we put it through both a temperature and humidity cycle, which is familiar to those in industry, maybe the automotive industry. We used a Volkswagen um, standard called the PV1200. And we had a look at the tensile strength and the stiffness of these materials after putting it through the cycle. And we found that the flax, for tensile strength, flax reduced by about 5%, whereas the glass, interestingly, reduced by about 10% for tensile strength. However, the stiffness of the flax fibers uh, was reduced by about 50%. So again, we need to really think about the limits of these materials and how we're going to be applying them in potential future applications. And then finally, we also um, utilized the NCC's rapid LCA capability. Um, this is a, a low level LCA which we use to um, really in the concept design phase where we can quickly assess what is the environmental impact of um, two materials um, and use that to identify hotspots in our design and our processes. Um, we also um, used our energy monitoring capability to have a look at what is the overmolder um, contributing to the overall part impact. And interestingly, um, from these results, a highlight um, the thing you can probably see straight away is that the flax PLA um, came out higher GWP um, global warming potential impact. Um, but this is actually entirely due to the PLA. Um, and I just want to highlight this isn't us saying that PLA is the devil, but just saying that maybe we need to focus on um, optimizing the production of PLA to make it more viable as it is compostable. Um, and also, um, the other thing to highlight is that the flax fibers did greatly. Um, reduce in impact compared to glass fibers. Um, and this was even with quite a conservative approach to our LCA. So we didn't include um, biogenic carbon absorbed and put back into the ground by flax. Um, so even with this conservative outlook on flax fibers, they have greatly improved um, impact over flax. Uh, and then something I also wanted to highlight from the LCA, we're trying to look more at other environmental impacts than just global warming because more than CO2 emissions are damaging our environment at the moment. So we're seeing it, um, especially with biocomposites, it's really important to look at acidification, eutrophication, and things like freshwater ecotoxicity. Um, and as we can see, like all, all materials are performing differently in each of these categories. So to highlight flax, the use of fertilizers and pesticides increase its eutrophication, um, which um, means that we need to be working more with, you know, further up the supply chain and looking at fibres like hemp, which actually reduces this impact. Um, so recently we were both in attendance at the NICE uh, Biocomposites Conference with Simon, 
and we had the chance to speak to folk from all across the supply chain, which was really helpful. Um, we were speaking to the growers, the formatters, material suppliers and end users, and we kind of got to understand the challenges that each of them are facing and the gaps that they have. So growers are looking to understand those end applications and making sure that the demand is there. Whereas formatters, interestingly, the UK supply chain has a big gap here uh, in terms of separating the fibres. Um, and then the end users and material suppliers both understand, want to understand a bit more about the properties and the variability of these materials coming from nature, as well as understanding the processing information, which is hopefully something we started to contribute to with this case study. So to summarise, um, we believe that natural fibre composites offer a great opportunity for composites to not just come from, but then re-enter natural systems at their end of life, in particular where recycling might not be viable. And it's also quite an exciting opportunity for the UK to be supplying these materials, things like UK grown hemp. Um, and we've shown in this case study that they can be used in high rate processes. But we still need to um, look into what polymers we need to be using to make them more circular. And then also looking into applying these materials to an in-service component so we can get a kind of fuller picture of what, what these materials look like in industry. And then applying that again to understand the kind of materials property variation and being able to put that into technical documentation and standardization from across the supply chain. And we've also seen uh, the importance um, that the NTC will have in linking up the supply chain, um, communicating demand up and down, um, and also getting more um, higher quality and UK-based LCA data. So thank you very much. We've had our one minute mark <laughs> at the end there. Um, thank you for your time. Any questions? And obviously, if you can't answer, if we can't answer them now, please do get in touch in the future. So thank you very much. We have time for some questions, if there are any. Hello. Um, yeah, Steve Icorn, Bristol Commerce Institute. It's interesting you talk. Thank you very much for an interesting talk. Is it very, very informative? Um, the the use of PLA, though. I mean, PLA. You say it's compostable, but we we lack compost composting facilities in the UK, and it's not easily compostable. It's not as easily compostable as people make out. So I just wondered, do you have any sort of comments to make about that? Absolutely. It's a really great question. And it's kind of part of this next phase of the project. We're in touch with um, a composting facility and a kind of end of life solutions facility in order to take this through the next stage. But in, to, our, to our understanding, the PLA is industrial, industrially compostable. So that being the vital word there. So there's certain environmental conditions that you have to place it in, in order for it to decompose in the correct manner. And then it has to be able to add nutrients to the soil, I think. Is that correct, Anna? Yeah. yeah. Um, so we are, and it's, it's phase two of this project as we're looking into doing that. But these trials take six months, unfortunately. So it's a bit of do it now and then we'll see it in the future, hopefully. So watch this space. Yeah, no, for sure, um, it's something that we think about a lot. We, we focused in this project on the technical feasibility of using the materials, but there is that full systems view of when you shred a car at its end of life, how do you separate out the materials that you need? How do you send them on to end of life? Um, so yeah, we're looking at it, but we do not have the answer, unfortunately, right now. Just, just a very quick question for me. So Ola Thompson, Bristol Commerce Institute. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, first thing was just an observation for me that, that it's, it's complex. So actually just replacing, say, conventional materials with bio-based materials, maybe not getting us there. So looking into the details of your LCA actually shows that there's some complexity that needs to be unfolded there. My real point was uh, you, you showed that the flax uh, PLA had rather disappointing tensile strength and, and flexural strength. And, uh, but perhaps that's not really the, the, the parameter you should focus on in, in most occasions. Many, many structures, are design drivers are not strength but stiffness. So what does, does it look like for stiffness? And maybe I could hope that it's not as bad as that. Absolutely. A any, any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, the specific stiffness of flax fibres is traditionally known to be reasonably similar to glass fibres, e-glass. Um, however, I think from looking at that and from, from trying to answer the industry questions of they're usually looking at tensile performance and strength performance there, um, we kind of wanted to highlight that 
as a as a direction that okay this is not the route to go down so how can we use these fibers as, as a kind of opportunistic way in an alternative route perhaps and again I mentioned the design aspect of it it's something that we really need to look into next and looking into the modeling of that and how we can kind of augment those those maybe slightly lacking pr properties with clever design okay we'll go to Paul for a final question Paul Hogg Avalon uh, consultancy one of the things that's intrigued me recently is people suggesting that a, a, an end-of-use route for uh, natural fiber composites would be conversion into biochar, uh, which would allow you to use, say, a polypropylene derived from natural precursor material as opposed to a compostable polymer. Have you any? Have you looked at that? And have you any any grasp on the environmental benefits? I. I've read many papers on biochar. Some say it's got great benefits for adding it to soil, and others say, not much. And, and I'm, I'm really uncertain, so I'd be very interested if you've got any comment on that. It's unfortunately not something that I'm an expert on. Um, my understanding from um, the work that some of the companies at the NIACE conference are doing, I think the Northern Ireland Flax and Hemp Association are looking into biochar as well. Mm -hmm. um, we know it's a route. We're not saying the only route's composting. I suppose that's just the route we've investigated here. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd direct you to those, and I can I can look at my contacts there afterwards and link you up to someone else who knows more than I do. Mm -hmm. I, I think I remember them talking about using it in pharmaceuticals and a whole variety of uh, kind of opportunities that I wouldn't have associated biochar with. Um, so we'd have to look at our notes again. Apparently but you can add it to animal feed. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, as much <laughs> as much methane. <laughs> um, That's new to me. Thank you. <laughs> yep, great question. Okay, so I'd like to thank our speakers again. And welcome our next speaker um, from the University of Bristol and Bristol Composite Institute, uh, Dr. Hima Nuzar. Good afternoon, everyone. I know we'll be wondering what the future holds for sustainability. Have you ever wondered why there are environmental pollutions? Have you also wondered why some environments experience uh, degradation and deforestation? Have you asked why plastics are always found in most oceans? I have on the screen a beautiful image is showing an untouched environment. This is a perfect contrast of uh, what we see today in terms of uh, environmental degradation and deforestation. So as we talk about sustainability today, let us all remember the importance of uh, preserving this uh, beauty for future generation. My name is Sinyoma Wozo. I am a polymer chemist and scientist. My previous research team was uh, centered on developing sustainable alternative material sources to conventional polymer raw materials. And um, my previous research was focused on uh, synthesis, functionalization, characterization, and uh, applications of uh, sustainable polymer raw materials, development of a uh, novel so solution to the pressing issues of uh, composite material waste, and development of uh, innovative sustainable manufacturing techniques. I am currently working with Nescom as a research associate, and my role is to improve the compressive performance of uh, polymer composites using conventional uh, fiber reinforcement. I intend to achieve this, taking inspiration from natural materials through a hierarchical approach. Sustainable materials are simple materials made from renewable sources that can be recycled into other engineering products, thereby reducing waste and then preserving the environment. As we go on today to discuss about sustainability, it is very important for us to know what actually makes this uh, material sustainable. Sustainable materials should at least exhibit these four major characteristics as seen on this uh, Venn diagram. The world of uh, composite manufacturing today are faced with a lot of challenges, which I've already listed here. And for us to overcome these challenges, it is very important for us to incorporate sustainability in composite manufacturing. And how do we achieve this? 
This can be achieved by extensively considering the parameters I've listed here for sustainable engineering. Um, the uh, statistics have it today that uh, out of uh, the 110,000 tons of um, composite manufactured annually in the UK, only 15% are being recycled. The question now is, what happens to the remaining um, 85%? The bulk of the challenge now lies with um, polymer chemists or polymer scientists to be able to ascertain whether the sustainable awareness of um, three Rs, the reduce, the reuse, and recycle, is actually working at this uh, environmental awareness period. The world's population is ever growing, demanding constant sustainable food production. And what does it mean? It means when we produce enough food, enough uh, um, agricultural waste will be generated. Now the question is, how do we manage this agricultural waste generated through sustainable food production? Do we burn them or do we just allow them to waste? If we burn them, definitely it's going to lead to environmental pollution, which is always harmful to the environment and then human being as well. So one important way of um, doing this is to convert this um, agricultural waste to useful material, that is um, cellulose materials for sustainable engineering. And the diagram above shows how we can achieve this for sustainable solution and to be able to overcome the challenge of uh, environmental pollution. In a bid to promote sustainability in composite manufacture, we have developed a process of synthesizing bio-based resin from agricultural waste. This proje project uh, was very successful because we are able to synthesize a green resin that was as good as a conventional ones. We have also fabricated nanobiocomposite. Using the bioresin we synthesized from our previous research um, and also nanomaterials from agricultural waste. We also recorded success because we are able to showcase one of the potentials of uh, the bio-based resin we synthesized in our pre previous work. In order to overcome the environmental nuisance uh, posed today by um, water hyacinth. We developed a process and then manufactured a um, nano composite for food packaging application. Of course, we recorded who's, uh, success in this uh, project because we were able to convert agricultural weed to sustainable material. We have also utilized agricultural waste to synthesize um, reinforcing fibers for um, composite manufacture. This uh, composite was utilized for um, car bumper application. It also recorded good success because we were able to overcome the problem of environmental pollution for a sustainable engineering material. To be able to overcome the problem of uh, plastic litter in the environment and in ocean, we developed a process of inducing biodegradation in polyethylene films. So you can see the setup process. We also recorded success because we were able to overcome the problem of uh, plastic litter and then uh, induce uh, a process of inducing um, biodegradation in thermoplastics. Looking at the level of uh, environmental impact from the release of um, dye effluent from industries, we were able to conceive fabricate and develop a, a um, combined dye extractor and then um, dryer machine. And we utilized the machine to extract dyes from natural plants. It was just a huge success because we were able to develop a sustainable and um, eco-friendly system of um, dye production and um, utilization. Please, for more information on the key results from this uh, technical section, you may wish to look at uh, the journal publications. Utilizing natural materials offer tremendous uh, benefits, environmental benefits. But however, there are key challenges associated to the use of uh, these uh, materials, and these are listed here on the screen. To be able to obtain optimal results, these key challenges 
they need critical attention. Sustainable composite materials are vital in addressing environmental challenges because they offer a path to reduce the carbon emission and to overcome some of the environmental challenges posed today by the composite industry. We have recorded numerous um, achievements in order to promote sustainability in composite manufacture. And this includes synthesizing bio-based resin from agricultural waste, fabrication of uh, nanobiocomposites for sustainable engineering application, that's carbon bumper application, production of food packaging films from agricultural wheat, fabrication of composites for automobiles, and uh, successful creation of a system that induces biodegradation in polyethylene films, designing a process of sustainable process of um, um, dye production and um, um, utilization. As the world advances uh, in technology, natural materials or natural or sustainable, sustainable materials have the potential to offer sustainable solutions in various composite industries while re remedying some of these challenges. With this, the environmental performance of composites will continue to grow to a more sustainable alternative solutions so long as a sustainable innovation is sustained. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. So do we have some questions? So I'd like to, to start with one of my own. Okay. So the, the materials um, that, that we are aiming for, for in terms of um, uh, natural and sustainable, we inherently want them to be, um, said, biodegradable and um, uh, be able to be broken down. How do we contrast um, that with um, materials that are able to uh, sustain the design life of, of a component without degradation? Because at some point, you almost need it to be kind of a switch between in service yeah. and then out of service and being broken down. So your, your car bumper example, you don't want to see w um, degradation of material properties uh, and ultimately affecting uh, vehicle safety during the life of the product, but then you very quickly want to say, right, this is no longer in a product, now I want to um, get rid of it. How do you sort of contrast those two uh, competing uh, demands? And one, that is one of the challenges I mentioned here. You can see the third bullet point said durability and aging. That is the major challenge we have um, in, in agricultural materials in terms of strength. In terms of strength and um, aging, as in their duration, their life cycle, some of them degrade even before the end of um, the uh, material you're using in question. So it's a very big challenge and we are still progressing. We are still progressing in sustainab sustainability to be able to make this material life cycle to um, a kind of extend and to even increase the strength. It's not only the life cycle, even the strength, because there are some, there are some treatments they will undergo at the end of the day. They will fail before the end of uh, whatever you're doing. So it's a very big challenge, and we're working towards improving these uh, challenges I listed here. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, I'm wondering about um, how much of a kind of vertical integration into agriculture you're maybe... How much, sorry? Vertical integration of these technologies into agriculture you're potent or if there's any vertical integration in terms of the films Vascular. that are you... Ver, ver, uh, so I'm... Uh, I suppose I'm looking at it from you're producing films yes. that for the food packaging industry, which I imagine yes. is quite tricky in terms yes. of sta um, regulations. But the agricultural industry uses films and things to maybe wrap their hay bales or potentially the resins that could be used. I'm not sure particularly, but I, I'm just wondering if there's anything going on in that sphere. Yeah, let me correct an impression. In food packaging, we don't use resin, we use gelatin because we are talking about food we eat. Resin is a different thing, is a different, although all of them are nanocomposite, but this one is serving a different purpose. 
So we use gelatin that is uh, eco-friendly because when you look at food packaging, we have various, uh, various types of uh, themes for food packaging because you need to know what kind of food are you packaging with these themes. So that's why we don't use, we don't use resin, whether epoxy or bio-based. We use gelatin for this packaging application. And to add to the question the first uh, person asked, there are, there are certain things we need to do, certain reinforcement or functionalization on the surface of the fibers. We sometimes, we coat these fibers with other nanomaterials like holocyte nanoclay, um, carbon nanotubes, um, um, gel um, expand graphite nanotubes, and other nanoparticles. So when you coat them, they are more stronger than when you use them before. That's why I said sometimes you use a hierarchical approach. Combine the natural fibers with other nanomaterials in order to strengthen them and also to prolong their life cycle. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we move on to our final speaker in this session on uh, natural uh, materials, and that's Kyle Pender from the National Composite Center. Okay, perfect, thank you. Hey, good morning. Thanks for the introduction. So yeah, my name is Kyle Pender. I'm a research engineer in our sustainability team at NCC, and today I'm going to talk about a project that I am um, technical lead on from NCC side called Pilot for Seams. I'll talk about what seams means later on in, in the presentation. But essentially, we're looking to support the development of the next generation of high-performance, quality-assured recycled carbon fibers. OK, so I'll start by setting the scene, kind of giving the why behind what we're doing. So it's clear that for the UK to meet its net zero emissions targets, we're going to see a rapid growth in both wind energy generation as well as hydrogen storage capacity both of which are likely to be very carbon fibre hungry. Therefore, we're expected to see uh, a rapid growth in the demand for carbon fibre in the UK over the next few years. Unfortunately, the UK doesn't have much sovereign capability in producing carbon fibre. So we're expecting to see a significant shortage of carbon fibre over the next few years, which could put our um, targets for 2050 in, in jeopardy. So the proposition of, of this work really is that in order to meet our net zero emissions targets, and ensure UK energy security. We need solutions that can establish a UK circular economy for carbon fibre, which ensures um, high value routes to market, particularly in those green energy applications that I mentioned. <coughs> so recycled carbon fibres are available commercially already, typically short discontinuous that you can see here. Um, and often they're relegated to the lower performance applications um, with less ability to kind of replace the virgin materials. Um, the value proposition here is that there is some products um, that end of life, such as film line products or, or tanks, which do actually have continuous or semi-continuous tools still in them. So if we recycle these in an appropriate way, we can in theory extract those continuous carbon fibres, which may be a better drop-in solution to um, virgin materials in some cases, right? and therefore have a, a greater potential to actually replace virgin materials uh, and ensure our UK resource and energy security. Um, one thing I want to highlight here is that you know, most of the waste will probably still be in this discontinuous format anyway. Um, so we still obviously need high value solutions for this discontinuous material, like what we heard from about Linea and what I think Phil will talk about later. Okay, so about a year and a half ago, we did a little demonstration um, piece of work to, to kind of showcase this, this potential solution. So we started with an end of life pressure vessel. We put it through a thermal recycling process to remove the polymer and then um, expose the, the carbon fiber wrap. We then manually unwound that at NCC and re spilled that back onto bobbins. And then we collaborated with Signet Texkimp to demonstrate wet filament winding with these recycled tools back onto a type 4 pressure vessel lining. And a sort of tank to tank demonstration, really showing that of, of the possible. Um, this, these materials are not without their challenges though. So this is some images of some of the tools that we got from that unwinding. 
You can see a lot of macro scale defects on these toes, things like fluffing, twisting, inconsistency in the toe width. Obviously, these are going to have or provide challenges um, when trying to handle these materials. Made worse by the fact that there's no sizing on this. Right? So all of this combined is likely to um, jeopardize the performance of any secondary composites made with these materials. In that light, we did some um, single fiber tensile testing as well, finding that the strength and stiffness of these materials was similar to what we'd see in industrial grade carbon fiber, something similar to a PX35. PX35 is widely used within Wembley structures, which is expected to be the largest user of carbon fiber in the future. So clearly there is a market for materials of this grade. But I think I'd be lying and you wouldn't be fooled if I said I think this is a robust enough analysis to give confidence to the supply chain to use these materials. This is very much uh, an early exploratory piece of work. And that brings me on to Pilot for Seams, which I mentioned already. So Pilot for Seams is a six million pound project where we're looking to demonstrate the need and develop the business case for a new R&D asset in the Greater Manchester region called Seams, or the Centre of Excellence for Advanced Materials Sustainability. This is funded through the Greater Manchester Innovation Accelerator. It's a consortium of different academic institutes and, and, and RTOs. And the NCC, along with Signet Techscamp, um, who we collaborated with in that initial sprint project, we have about a million pounds from that to help position Seams the centre with quality assurance capability, um, really trying to overcome a key challenge associated with recycled or, or circular materials, and that's given the supply chain of confidence in the quality and consistency of these materials. So NCC is leading a work package in Pilot for Seams, where we're developing and demonstrating capability to um, quality assure recycled carbon fibres that are in a, a continuous format from, from end of life pressure vessels. And this will benefit seems the future centre um, by providing them with a very unique quality assurance capability that is kind of ideally suited for net zero critical uh, materials. Okay, so those are some nice kind of headlines, but what are we actually doing in this, in this project? So Signet Techscamp at the moment are commissioning a, a large scale recycling unit in their facilities based off of B&M Longworth's DCOM thermal recycling process. Um, and we need to optimise that for continuous tools. Um, so it's going to be very different to recycling kind of traditional shredded materials. NCC is supporting that data acquisition and analysis to guide that optimization. NCC is uh, leading a piece of work to develop an inline tow inspection capability. So the vision here is that we integrate an inline inspection and um, technology into the unwinding phase so that we can identify, uh, categorize and track different tow defects like some of the ones you've seen in the, in the picture before. And then using that information, we can kind of better direct optimal routes to markets for different batches based on their, their quality. We're looking at things like uh, laser profiling, optical uh, imagery, combining that with machine learning to, to try and support this piece of work. We're also collaborating with uh, MPL, National Physical Laboratory, and University of Manchester to explore uh, in situ Raman spectroscopy as a way of assessing the mechanical properties of these materials. Um, live uh, and through non-destructive testing. So that's a nice kind of fundamental piece of work we're getting to do within this, this project. So in addition to that, we're also looking to develop offline uh, quality assurance capability so we can better compare recycled and, and virgin counterparts. So because a lot of the recycled materials or recycled carbon fibres are discontinuous, it means that often they're tested using single fibre tensile testing. Virgin carbon fibres are not tested that way. Um, typically using a, an impregnated tool method. So there's a disconnect there between how recycled materials are tested versus virgin. And we have an opportunity here to, to try and overcome that by the fact that we're producing materials in a similar format to, to virgin. So we need to, these are not off the shelf pieces of equipment to do the sample preparation. So we want to develop that so we can get that a consistent and repeatable um, way. So th they form the main part of our quality assurance piece. We're also looking at doing some demonstration pieces as well. So using these recycled materials both in the production of intermediate products, so things like um, fabrics, preforms, prepregs, as well as using those intermediates in the production of secondary composite materials, validating them. Um, we'll be drawing on, on the kind of wealth of capability we have at NCC, as well as Signet Tentscamp, um, but yeah, we're reaching out to, to academia, to RTOs, and, and to the supply chain to fill any capability gaps there and um, to do some other demonstration pieces. And in addition to this, we're also collaborating with MPL and the Henry Royce Institute, who are both on Pilots for Seams. They're primarily working on other work packages, but they were really interested in what we're doing here. They have a lot of 
uh, obviously material characterization capability. So we're happy for them to, to get involved and, and support on that. Um, so we're working on three different um, projects with them, or kind of sub-projects. Um, identifying the use uh, or post-processing requirements for polymers that are, are reclaimed from this process. So I've talked a lot about carbon fiber um, recycle it, but the signet text count process has the ability to, um, to reclaim the polymer. We don't have a use case or route to market yet, so we want to try and understand what that is and, and find value in it. The second project is identifying, trialing, and demonstrating post-processing um, requirements to improve surface reactivity or functionality of these materials. So I mentioned already that there's no sizing on them, so we need to understand do we need to size? If we do, do we need to do any pre-processing, such as cleaning or, or kind of refunctionalization like you would do with virgin materials? And lastly, we need to um, kind of characterize the, the functional properties of these recycling materials. Again, I've talked a lot about mechanical properties. We don't really understand how recycling affects the electrical or the thermal properties, which are obviously important in kind of multifunctional applications. I think I'm also missing a slide. Um, so uh, we've done some, some trials already, some demonstration pieces. Um, I had some images, but I'll just, I'll just verbalize them here. So you've seen a wet film winding um, tank demo that we did. We've also collaborated with the University of Manchester and done some braiding trials with Professor Prasad's team. Um, they were very successful and we're going to take what we've learned from those trials and use them in our, our scaled-up braiding process. Um, we've also done in-house some tailor fibre placement trials and created a little demonstrator uh, component for a bicycle gear system. Um, I think what other ones we did Let's talk about. Yeah, and we did some 2D and 3D weaving trials with these materials over in um, Belfast, in Ninas. They've got a, a weaving loom that we were able to access. So we've made some, some small-scale weaving, um, woven fabrics, and demonstrating their use in, in there. So in the pipeline, we have uh, continuous film in 3D and um, 3D printing. Then we also have um, protrusion trials in the pipeline, which are obviously really important for wind blade applications, um, as more and more of these protruded profiles are being used within the spark apps. So yeah, I'm just going to finish off by um, saying that we know, I hope you can see why we're very excited to be um, leading this piece of work. Uh, and I hope that um, if there's any opportunity that you think or have any ideas we to collaborate, we're more than happy to, to do so in anything that I've, I've talked about so far today. So please do get in contact and I'd be happy to, to work with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Interesting talk. Um, step away from the feedback. Um, do we have questions for Kyle? Sorry. I'll rank my way up. Hi, uh, Ben Lloyd, Signet TechSkimp, um, technical lead on PCMs for Signet TechSkimp, so a bit of a loaded question here. Um, just on a uh, comment on the pictures of the defects in the recycled material, a lot of those come from the initial material processing, not the recycling process. And as the, the pr recycling process is optimized, you will see less and less of those defects. But design from understanding of how those defects form and how they affect the material in manufacture and designing to reduce those in manufacture, now that we can see how they form in the recycled material, is going to be paramount to be getting more and more usable material from the process. Um, and that's something that the Seams Project's going to um, hopefully address as well, and it allows our industrial partners to look at how they design for manufacture more appropriately in um, high-speed automated manufacture of um, composites, and that's something we hope to look at with the guys as well. Um, just a comment, really, not more, not a question. But also, yeah, hello, that, Kyle. Nice to meet you. Yeah, they are. Um, yeah, but they're extreme cases of defects. You have to kind of look through quite a lot of material to find them, um, and this was a. Uh, Sample size of one, you know, we put one tank through for the sprint project, um, in no way is it optimized, uh, and it was actually using a different recycling process than, than Signet's developing anyway, so it's, uh, it's, it's not necessarily comparable to what we're doing in, in pilots for Seams. Okay, thank you. If I may jump in with a question mm -hmm. too. Have you done any life cycle analysis or assessment on um, the, the, re but the reclaimed toes, for example, compared to the, some of the, the natural fiber toes. So if, for example, in your LCA, you, you got your carbon fiber in at a kind of discounted rate for, for the, the carbon um, 
carbon cost of it, how does that compare against, I guess, sort of almost your competitor of, of a, a more bio-based material in terms of your overall um, uh, uh, cost? And then I guess a sort of related question, just on the LCA of the reclamation process, how does your embodied energy of a reclaimed fibre compare again to the alternatives? <coughs> I'll answer the, the, the second one first. Um, you know, it's difficult to tell since we have a very small scale process that's been done so far. We haven't yet used Signet's um, larger scale operation, which we think would be a lot more efficient, of course. So within Pilot for Seams, there's ambition to, to do that. And you know, NCC has a lot of capability in the life cycle assessment, and that's something we want to, want to explore for sure. I would say that it's quite difficult to make it <laughs> have a higher embodied energy than, than virgin carbon fibre. So it's a lot easier for carbon than it is for the likes of glass. Um, so I'm, I'm not saying we, we can count our chickens yet, but I think you know, it, it is difficult to, to surpass that in terms of you know, energy density. Um, in terms of you know, flax or hemp, I, I don't know if they're necessarily direct competitors. Um, flax is obviously very, flax and hemp are very low. Um, if you include the biogenic carbon absorption, this is negative. If you don't, maybe one or two kilograms of CO2 um, over its lifetime. Very low, whereas carbon fiber obviously is up to like 30 for new. Um, and even if you try and recycle it, I think you will struggle to get as low as one or two kilograms of CO2 equivalent for one kilogram of, of recycled carbon fiber, personally. So uh, yeah, I'm not sure whether it's necessarily going to be that feasible to, to match flax or hemp, but we'll see. We don't, we don't know yet. No, I guess you're not looking to match it. You, you are sort of look. It, it's going to be part, all part of a, a portfolio of of more sustainable um, materials as as we go into the future. And I guess thinking t in terms of our, our industry colleagues and users, they're going to have, have to be making choices to say, well, I, I want to lower my carbon footprint, but I perhaps need the performance of a, a carbon fiber material, uh, or I can redesign my component to to actually make better use of. Um, the natural materials uh, properties. And these are, all, as a community, I think these are all challenges yeah. that we're going to have to, to address to, to help people make these choices in the future. Yeah. I mean, electrification and, and the green energy transition solves all, <laughs> all problems when it comes to recycling, right? So we've got that to look forward to. You know, maybe a lot of these are temporary issues, and when we get green energy, um, perhaps we, we, you know, we, we don't have such a, a concern, but that's a while yet. Yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so now we, we change gear a little bit um, and, and we, we move into the, the real um, high performance end of, of use of composites into ceramic uh, matrix composites. And we have two speakers on this. Um, and our, our first uh, speaker is uh, Vertudius Rubio from the National Composite Center. Over to you. Thank you. Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about ceramic matrix composites. Um, I'm working in the advanced material team at NCC. Um, I'm going to talk today about ceramic matrix, matrix composites for nuclear fusion energy applications. So I'm going to start with a short introduction about why the fusion has been interesting for the scientists for the last 60 years and why the recent year can be even more important. So by 2050, it's believed that the planet will be twice energy that is using today. So no single technology will fulfill this demand. So currently, the fossil fuel is the 80% of the development world energy that we are using. And in the future, we are going to co have constraint about the supply and also restriction for environmental protection that we already have. So the nuclear fission, the growth can be lim limited by the supply of uranium, not very close, but in 250 years, probably we are not going to have more. The, and also the public and political acceptability of this energy. Uh, the renewable energy is a good alternative, but is very reliant on environmental condition. And actually we have also the problem about the large scale energy storage. So nuclear fusion can be a long term solution where abundant source of supply for thousands of years. So more uh, advantage of the fusion energy is that it's a 
clean energy, uh, zero carbon emission, energy security, as I said, uh, we have fuel is abundant and well distributed around the earth, on, on Earth, and is reliable, um, scalable, and minimal land or separation from social infrastructure, and uh, versus to uh, fission, the safety advantage of not melt on, meltdown are possible, no long-term high-level radioactive waste, and no fissile material like uranium or plutonium present, on very low non-proliferation risk. Actually, fusion could generate four times more energy than fission per kilogram of fuel, um, nearly four million times more energy than burning oil or coal. So there are many challenges to commercializing the fusion energy. So and the, that one that is more important for us is the material science, is where we can contribute. So new materials are required that can bear this uh, harsh and stream environment that are producing in the reactor. And here is where NCC thinks that can help and contribute with the development of the ceramic matrix composite, and more specifically, specifically with silicon carbide, silicon carbide composites. So why the six sig material, six sig composites are so promising for this fusion energy application? So its properties is high temperature resistant, radiation resistant, low neutron activation, high strength and stiffness, high thermal conductivity, and a good compatibility with the tritium. So currently, the one of the, the components that uh, is uh, interesting for you, Sig Sig, is the breathing blanket. The breathing blanket is a uh, half contained channel inside where the coolant is running and is extracted the heat to transfer later on of uh, electricity. So currently, the other material that uh, can be used for this one are steels or vanadium alloys that can go to 350 to 450 degrees C, but the use of silicon carbide, silicon carbide material, make that we can go to 900, 1000 degrees C. So that means that we can extract more heat and transform later on in electricity from the same amount, from the same reaction. So that uh, is uh, giving uh, a lot of more electricity generated and also up to 20 billion on lifetime revenue of the future reactor, uh, future fusion reactor. So the research and the development uh, that are essential to others manufacturing challenges and optimize the six sig performance. We've been done an analysis of uh, the current situation about the manufacturability of six sig material in UK. And we found that the supply chain is very immature. We most of the material that uh, we need to use for the manufact manufacturability of this material are from overseas, so mainly Japan and US, so everything is restric restricted by the export control. If we focus on the manufacturability, there are many stages of the process that still need to be developed, like inspection, machining, or joining. Um, also, we have a problem with capabilities. Currently, most of uh, the capabilities are in academia, so small furnaces that we can produce only sample. We cannot produce a, a middle side or full side uh, component. So all this needs to be addressed if we want to contribute in the future to these uh, uh, reactors. So the work that we've been doing in the last year at NCC has been fo focused in the development of a new manufacturing route. Currently, the material for the six sig material for fusion uh, is manufactured by CBI. This, this uh, pro manufacturing process consumes a lot of time and also is very expensive. So we've uh, developed a new manufacturing route in collaboration with uh, UKAEA um, that has demonstrated uh, potential to reduce cost by more than 80% and cycle time by 50% unlock many potential future application and projects. In this project, we also involve the modeling because the, if we have uh, the modeling capability, this is going to help to accelerate the selection of the proper material to move to the industrialization. One example of this one is, for example, the interface that uh, needs to be between matrix and fibers. So, 
Today, nobody knows exactly which is the best material for interface for fusion, uh, for, for, for these environments in fusion. But and there are many of a material that has been proposed. So if we have a modeling that can help us to do a down selection and manufacture more focus on what material are going to be performing better, this is going to accelerate all the process. So our vision is contribute to the material supply chain and capabilities development in the UK. One example of this one is next week on Thursday, we have a TNCC and extreme environmental material um, conference where we are going to try to put together the end user, the academia and the supplier to try to start building all this connection and be moving in this line where currently we are, last year we were doing only flat panel, develop this new manufacturing route. This year we are working in the optimization of uh, the manufacturing route and trying to do semi-complex shape. And the following year we're going to move from complex shape, scalability, until get the full components uh, with joining and machining development behind all, all this. So the, the conclusion uh, that I can say is, uh, Fusion offer a long-term energy source and is a, a very good option for the future. The extreme environment in the fusion react, reactor require new material that can withstand this condition. SIGSIG is a promising material because it's high temperature, radiation resistant, low neutron activation and mechanical strength. The supply chain uh, in UK uh, and the lack of capability make that very difficult to manufacture this kind of material and is something that needs to be addressed to respond to the future demand. And the NCC has uh, developed a new manufacturing process with cuts cost by 80% relative to the status quo and has identified important challenge for the sick sick scalability. So that's my last slide, so thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Thanks. Uh, my name is Andy Smith from Carbon360. Um, just really interested in the process. I guess you've kind of skirted around that probably for good reason. Uh, can you say anything more about the material format or the process? Is it a pre-peg? Is it a liquid infiltration process, etc.? I cannot talk anything because it's under IP evaluation. So I cannot talk about that, sorry. I thought that might be the case, all right. <laughs> uh, in regards to the 80% reduction in cost, is that for the material or is that for the production? It's for the production. Okay. Hi, Dominic from SHD. You mentioned this conference supply chain event you're having next week. What is it you're looking for in terms of UK <coughs> partners? Is there anything specific that you're looking for? Um, mainly it's going to be ceramic matrix composite and everybody that is working with SIGSIG or OXOX materials. We try to find the new research that Academia is doing here in UK to try to help them to scale up and at the same time, looking for supplier that can help, uh, help us to go to the scalability and do real dimension of components. So we are going to have intermediate supplier like, uh, for example, ATL, that is the one that helps us with the CBI or CBD in fibers. So, and supplier of, yeah, of, of furnaces, um, ceramic powder, matrices, and end user like, Rolls-Royce or UKAEA. Okay, let's thank. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> so our next um, talk in this session uh, will focus on a, a slightly different uh, high temperature application for, for 6.6, this time from the aerospace industry, and I'll pass over to Lewis Kawashita to tell us more about that. 
So I'll be talking about damage modeling of uh, 660 MCs. The work is supported by Rolls-Royce through the uh, Composites University Technology Center. Work was mostly conducted by Peter Foster, who's here in the audience, and also Adam Thompson, and they will gladly help answer any difficult questions you may have. So um, really, the, the questions raised to us by, mostly by the industrial partners were, uh, can we adapt? So this was the first project we had in DUTC on CMC materials. Can the models that we've been developing over the years for uh, OMCs be adapted for these new class of materials? How can we best model the complex, very complex damage mechanisms in these materials? And uh, also at which length scale do we need uh, uh, to model them, having in mind that in industry we want to really be able to predict the life of a component, uh, so a component level analysis. And can we make suitable assumptions to overcome partly the lack of data or the difficulty in characterizing the various um, components or the various constituents in these materials? So what we developed over the years is the response, I would say, from the UTC is uh, divided in three aspects. One is the, uh, how to obtain the um, a faithful representation of the material architecture um, with uh, simulations of um, weaving, uh, draping, compaction, and then converting those uh, simulations into uh, continuum um, finite element models. Um, I'm mostly talking about the, um, um, so the material models today and then showing some results afterwards. Right, so the uh, material model, so the, at least the elastic part of, of the elasticity part of the material modeling is based on a Mori Tanaka homogenization, where <clears throat> for, uh, if we have, for example, a single inclusion in a matrix, you need to first uh, compute or define what's the strain concentration tensor that connects the far few the strains to the strain observed or experienced by that inclusion. And then with, in possession of that, which depends on the, um, on the uh, shape of that inclusion, we can derive a homogenized uh, material stiffness tensor um, for the composite as a whole. So we need the elastic properties, fiber volume fraction, volume fraction of the constituents, and the shape of the inclusions. So uh, when applying this to these uh, 660 CMCs, uh, the homogenization has to be done in several steps. Firstly, we combine the, that uh, fiber coating or interface, which in this case is a boron nitride interface, uh, with the fiber itself and do a first step homogenization. And then later, so this is one major assumption uh, in the work. And the second major assumption is that we combine all the different constituents of the, matri the bulk matrix itself that can be um, uh, chemical uh, vapor infiltrated silicon carbide, uh, so uh, CVI. Um, so there's a, there, um, grains of uh, slurry as well, and then also a silicon melt infiltration uh, process. So what we get out of these two-step homogenization is a, ma a model of a yarn, okay? And the yarn can be applied, uh, for example, in a voxel model uh, to certain domains that we define from the, the draping or, or weaving uh, simulations. So you can have a voxel model made of, let's say, pure bulk matrix plus yarns um, at different fiber volume fractions. And then combined with the more Tanaka homogenization, that's one of the novel aspects of the work, is, these, uh, is the damage model. So it's an energy regularized continuum damage mechanics model applied mostly to the matrix material. And uh, so if you were to plot the stress strain response of that material, you would see for pure matrix or for the yarns loaded transversely, you would see an elastic regime and then a softening regime. And the area uh, highlighted here is, the, is related to the, um, to the energy released when you um, fully fail that, that portion of material. Uh, however, when we are loading a yarn longitudinally in the fiber direction, uh, the main assumption made here is that the matrix itself, uh, once it reaches its, its strength, will have a, a regime of a constant stress and that is to model the, the microcracking, fiber slide and fiber matrix interaction that happens um, and the subsequent load redistribution within the material. Okay, and these two are combined in a, some sort of um, a mixed mode formulation where you can go from transverse loading to longitudinal loading any, anywhere in between. 
Uh, and this is the result of, of this off-axis simulation, off-axis tension simulation. Then you can see, um, highlighting here, what that constant stress assumption means. It actually means overall that there will be a tangent modulus to the composite as the, um, the damage develops. And this is the result of uh, several off-axis tension tests. So you go from the very brittle case to the very um, pseudoductile case, depending on the direction of loading. Um, the model has been verified um, against experimental data, so you can see model and, and experiments uh, in, in, in one case here, uh, for what we call the mini composites, so uh, approximating a single yarn, and then also against um, microscale models of these yarns conducted um, through the PhD of Ricardo Mano uh, within the UTC as well. So from those um, draping and, and uh, compaction simulations, we also get, we don't, not only get the local uh, orientation of the yarn, but also the local fiber volume fraction. And the fiber volume fraction, as we would expect, has an effect on the stress strain behavior of that yarn, okay? So these models, although they are voxelized models, they, they have this extra layer of, um, um, I don't know, faithfulness or fidelity, which is the local variations in, uh, material orientation and fiber volume fraction. So now a series of um, uh, results um, conducted by both um, our industrial partners and also uh, the wider UTC network, um, starting from a notched uh, uniaxial tension test. So these are a bunch of uh, experimental curves. Um, we can extract some sort of envelope from, from those uh, results and compare our models against these um, experimental data. What you can see is a very good um, representation of the behavior up to a certain level of strain, and, um, and then somehow a, a slightly premature failure um, of the models compared to experiments. That, that's what we would ex expect given our, the assumptions made of the homogeneity of the matrix and uh, that uh, initial homogenization of the interface as well. But however, um, this is, um, appropriate for the type of analysis that um, we're looking after, so we're not really interested in what happens at the very far end of the stress strain behavior. Um, some contours of stresses, the no values, just to show the effect in the elastic regime of that um, um, voxelization of yarns and fiber volume fractions and uh, material stiffnesses, you can see the stresses um, uh, being different between um, weft and warp yarns and also the matrix, okay? So, um, yeah, both in the pristine case and after some uh, damage develops. So here, we're going from left to right and then first the, the, the top column, uh, top uh, row and then the bottom row. Um, seeing the evolution of damage in uh, both matrix, bulk matrix and yarns as we increase the applied strain. So initially it's all elastic and then eventually you start, uh, you see the, the, the damage kind of concentrating along the, the bulk matrix and the uh, weft uh, yarns. And eventually you end up with, um, I'm not sure if you can see spot here, but they're actually um, yarn failure, okay? And similar results shown in, in a different way, just showing the top yarns at the final failure, you can see those uh, small red uh, bands being um, yarn failure. And then also the, the weft and top and weft together. So one of the assumptions I mentioned before is the homogenization of the uh, matrix as a, as a bulk. So it's, it's made of different parts. Um, so we get very uh, good qualitative agreement with ob experimental observations in terms of the development of, of this damage. So these are um, SEM images uh, taken by the Swansea UTC. And we see, so the qualitative agreement is in this, what we call the, the tram track um, pattern of uh, cracks and damaged bands in the model, where these cracks and bands um, occur so, sort of in parallel. Um, one of the limitations of the model is that the, that continuous, very homogenized matrix doesn't uh, allow for as many uh, cracks to nucleate as it happens in real life, okay? However, we are still happy with the results. And this modeling approach, just a couple of slides showing that the modeling approach can also, could also be used to quantify 
the um, effects of uh, variability uh, in terms of manufacture. For example, if you have a random shifting of the arms and plies with respect to each other, we can get a considerable uh, variation in the properties by just that very subtle um, manufacturing variability. And also in the actual material properties that we adopted um, by varying them from literature values to plus or minus uh, 20 or 50 percent, uh, you can evaluate the sensitivity uh, to the results. Um, and then the lar one of the largest models uh, run was a feature level model of uh, an open homotation case where, again, we get good agreement to the low strain uh, regime and then some deviation after uh, for the same reasons as for the near axial uh, tensile tests. Yeah, and then um, finally, uh, there is a, an, an option here just to do a further homogenization uh, level to get a fully um, homogenized known uh, yarn matrix model, but a fully homogenized model that is also able to capture somehow, as, as of course we lose some detail, but um, for larger components that will be an option. Okay, so that's it. So in summary, yes, I, I, we answered the, the three questions in the beginning. Um, and ongoing work and future work is on uh, introducing thermal environmental uh, creep and fatigue effects to this uh, modeling framework. Okay, thank you. So do we have any questions for Lewis? Or for Peter? Thanks, Lewis, for the really interesting presentation. Um, I wonder, have you thought about sort of 3D woven architectures and how the through thickness yarns might um, come into play and whether you have to model things differently or the effect of 3D woven materials? Um, yes, um, I'm not sure if um, work has already been conducted on it, but the modeling framework is, is, is very much compatible with uh, 3D woven materials. Uh, if there's no major change in the material system itself, I don't see any, any limitation on applying it. Um, but um, yes, I think that's what we can say. I could jump in with a, a little bit of uh, additional, I guess, history on, on the project, um, or certainly the weave, weave modeling uh, side. We actually started out life um, modeling 3D woven composites, and then we had to actually step back to the simpler case of doing 2D, and that was what um, Adam Thompson's uh, PhD was, was how do we um, apply some of our tools from 3D woven to uh, 2D woven. Fortunately, it turned out not to be quite as simple as we thought it was going to be. Um, and then we pulled some of those techniques um, uh, forward into um, this project, um, again, that, that Adam was uh, very, very heavily involved in. So, so now, where we're at today, we can work with 2D and 3D uh, woven materials almost interchangeably. Any further questions? Mike. Hi, I'm Mike Hinton. Hi, Mike. I, I'm curious, really. Perhaps we can have a discussion offline. Um, mm -hmm. Number one, it'd be useful to put up the properties of the matrix and the fibres, because yeah. some of us in the room who aren't CMC specialists wouldn't know what those properties look like. Yeah. Uh, the second, and it's really a, a, right back to the start of your presentation, where you've got... Uh, constitutive damage mechanics that you've applied mm -hmm. where you've then have decided what the slopes are. Well, mm -hmm. I'm guessing you've done some experiments to validate that, which I'm not sure you spoke about. Yes, no, so, um, so the, the material so, I mean, properties... So if, if I may, just yes, to finish sorry. up. So I, I'm guessing <laughs> that when you flow through, some of the things that you just showed will, will be dependent on what those front assumptions are, of course, which you yeah. didn't touch upon. So yeah, perhaps so you might just fill out the gaps on that. Yeah, Thank yeah. You. It, it is uh, kind of an um, intention that, um, so the, the work presented here is mostly based on literature data, um, but yes, there are uh, inputs also from experiments conducted by ourselves and the, the wider UTC network. But um, yeah, so the, the assumptions, uh, they're not totally off, out of thin air, they, they are based on observations. Sure. Okay, I think in the interest of time, we should move on to the um, final um, <laughs> session. Uh, sorry, thank, thank you, Lewis. Sorry.
Um, so we move on to the, the very last um, uh, se section in this um, session before we uh, break for lunch. Uh, and that is on um, future um, structural applications uh, for, for composites. And our first speaker in the session is uh, Professor Michael Wisnam, who, who will um, uh, open the session. Thank you. So I'm going to be talking about how we can use different combinations of materials to create new configurations with improved properties. And this is work which Dr. Shun Wu is going to present, but she has just got a lecturing position at Sussex University and is not able to be here today. I'm presenting the work on her behalf. So carbon fiber composites are wonderful materials. They're stiff, they're strong, they're light, they're durable. But one of the issues is that they tend to be brittle and we can have uh, relatively low failure strains and relatively brittle behavior. So this can also affect the, the ability to exploit these materials. Compressive and strength is another key limitation of carbon fiber composites. And, uh, they can, this can lead to weight penalties and resulting in potentially in catastrophic failures. So how can we address these problems and try to improve the behavior? So in this presentation, we're going to be covering about how to develop efficient and resilient composites, which by taking existing materials and reconfiguring them, introducing different failure mechanisms to control the behavior, and then also looking at how we can use different materials in different places within a laminate in order to tailor the behavior. So approaches here really are looking at hybridizing between different materials. So we have carbon fiber composites, which are brittle, low toughness, low deformation. And then we're going to hybridize those with higher strain materials, which have got longer elongation and uh, ability to, to absorb energy during deformation. And we can combine different types of materials. So in terms of the carbon fibers, there's a range of different types of carbon fiber, high modulus, high strength, intermediate modulus. And we can also be looking at different ply thicknesses, standard prepregs, but also ones with thin plies. And the high strain materials, there's a whole range of different materials which we can use, glass, polyethylene, nylon, aramid. And we can also look at incorporating different orientations of the angles, and also potentially metals as well. So what we're going to look at then is combining in different ways, either by blocking the materials together. So looking at blocks where we, we I shall show some results where comparing carbon with glass and with different combinations of carbon and glass hybridized together in a block form or in a ply-by-ply -ply hybridization where we, we try to, to bring different materials together at a lower level to influence the behavior. So for tensile loading, a lot of this work came out of a big program grant we had a, a couple of years back on hyperduct, high-performance ductile composites, where we showed we can get a very nice pseudoductile response in tension by hybridizing materials. And there's different ways that can be done. This over here shows what happens when we mix carbon and glass. And if we do it right, with the right combinations and the right architecture, we can get multiple fraction, fragmentation of the carbon. And this is still integral. And this gives us a stress drain of the curve with a plateau, which is very like the ductility you see in a metal. So we developed mats to be able to design these and to look at the different failure mechanisms and the different combination of properties so we can design it to get the response we want. And we also showed that this could also be done with different orientations. So here we've got, rather than hybridizing different carbon and glass, we've used different orientations of the material, an angle ply carbon with a unidirectional carbon, and in the same way been able to, to get this pseudoductile response. And as well as showing this plateau on the stress-strain plot, it also gives us notch insensitivity, which is one of the key reasons for doing it, of course. In a metal, you get local plasticity around a stress concentration, which relieves the stress. And we see the same thing happening. And here, we see this, this curve here is the baseline material. But then when we do a specimen with an open hole, then we get 
effectively we get the same net section stress as this pseudo yield stress we get in the unidirectional material. So we've got rid of that notch sensitivity because the damage occurs around the hole, the stress concentration, relieves the stresses and allows us to go further before ultimate failure. So that was tension. We've also looked at compression in some recent work which uh, our PhD student, Ari Tongres, has been doing, looking at combining this case S-glass and M55 high modulus carbon fibers. And uh, by looking at different combinations, the different thicknesses of this M55, this is a thick orientation with a lot of M55, here we've got two and one thin plies of that material. And what we see is that if we have the thin plies, we can get a similar fragmentation behavior in compression in these materials. And you see we have a, a fragment form there, but the, the glass plies are still intact. So these multiple fragmentations produce uh, a knee point and some nonlinearity in the stress strain response, similar to what we saw in tension. So what's interesting is to look at the different failure mechanisms, particularly as we change the thickness of that M55 carbon. So when we have the bulk material here, then we get, which is this has got 16 plies, then we see a catastrophic failure and we get a, a kink band similar to what we might see in uh, a standard composite and it delaminates. And we get a relatively low failure strain for that case because this M55 is, is a high modulus fiber. As we reduce the thickness of the band, then the failure mechanism transitions. So first of all, we start to see some of these multiple fragmentations, but then we still do get a, a catastrophic failure. But when we go to a single ply of only 0 0.03 millimeters of M55, we get these multiple fragmentations across there. These are fiber breaks. This is the loading direction. And we get this very uh, gradual failure process and an increase in the failure strain. So we see both a transition in the failure mechanism from a more catastrophic to a more gradual failure, and we also see an increase in the strain which it's able to take. And you can look at the overall behavior in compression, and this is a, a specimen with repeated sublaminates through the, the thickness and been loaded in compression, and you see we have this knee point on the stress strain curve, then eventually we get some delamination and finally, a catastrophic failure of the whole specimen. So we've introduced some sort of pseudoductility in this response. So what about impact? Now, this is a, a very complex problem with impact. The mechanisms are really complicated and not really well understood, despite all the work that's been done. We've got lots of different mechanisms for energy absorption. We have uh, local events that happen where we have contact and crush. We get shear failure, plugging, delamination, transverse cracking and filer failure, it's all very, very complicated. And what we've tried to do here is to look at the different aspects of that failure mechanism by trying to design laminates where we, we put different properties in different places. So for example, you may want to have on the compression surface the ability to, to take the load and redistribute it. In the middle, it may not be so important to have a high strength because actually if you have failure and delamination, it reduces the stiffness, which enables, enables taking larger energy because you get more deformation. And on the back, you want good tensile response and you want the ability to take large deformations and carry a load in tension rather than in bending. So this shows some work where uh, Shun tested some specimens which were all carbon, which are the, the, the black ones, all glass or hybrid composites. So the carbon is stiff, as you'd expect, uh, but the actual energy under there is not so good. By introducing the, the glass, we see an improvement in the response. And in fact, in this case here, the all glass gives the best response. The all glass gives us both the highest load and the largest energy underneath that curve. But it's interesting if you compare these two cases, they're both improvements on the carbon, but when we have the the glass on the compression side, it doesn't <coughs> produce such a, a large improvement. When we have the, the glass on the tension side, we get a much better improvement. And that's really to do with the fact that the, a lot of the energy comes from the bending and the tensile deformation on the back face. And it's better to have the high modulus, sorry, the high elongation material on the back compared with the, the front of the material. So 
let's look at another case here where, in this case, we've compared the basic carbon and glass with a hybrid where we've got different grades of carbon. So here we've got a high modulus carbon and uh, an intermediate modulus carbon on that base there. And what this does is it makes the failure a bit more gradual. Because we've got the high modulus carbon on the surface, we actually get a, a compression crack uh, a little bit earlier. So we get a compression crack on the surface. But because we only have the high modulus on the surface, it doesn't propagate right the way through the thickness. So we get initial failure first of all, but then we get a bit more gradual failure as this progresses, but not catastrophically. And so when you go past this point here, what you can see is after this compression crack here, it started to fail all the way through the carbon, and we got a sort of a, a sheer plugging mechanism. And then towards the end, this starts to fail, the glass starts to fail in, in tension. So quite a complicated mechanism. But, um, and we also have delamination, which complicates the picture. But overall, we can see that uh, we get a good response. And the final one I want to show here is where we look at introducing some thin carbon between the glass in order to introduce some of this fragmentation behavior, which we saw in the pseudoductile tensile mode. So by having this on the back face, what we want is to improve the, the energy absorption in tension on the back face. And you can see that this improves quite significantly over and above what we get with the glass. It both actually increases the load here because of the hybridization of the carbon, and then it gives us this much longer uh, plateau area here where what we're getting at that point there is the fragmentation. So we're getting fragmentation in the carbon because of the thin carbon in the glass. That fragmentation absorbs more energy and gives us an improved energy performance and ability to, to deal with penetration of, uh, under impact conditions. And potential future work and looking at, at, at cryogenic applications of thin ply materials. Uh, so this just shows a few results from a, um, a standard thickness material which has been uh, dunked at cryogenic temperature and then been loaded in tension. And we see that with the standard ply thickness, we get this matrix cracking and nonlinearity, whereas with the thin plies, it's linear to failure. And uh, no transverse cracks that are visible here on the edge of the specimen in the DIC compared to all these, these transverse cracks you see with a thick ply. So this is quite an interesting possibility of, of using these thin ply materials and perhaps bespoke architectures to deal with these cryogenic applications. So in conclusion, then, I've shown that, uh, that we've applied hybridization to improve the mechanical performance in different conditions. And we've done that by taking existing materials and then applying them in different ways to try to control the damage and the failure mechanisms. So in tension, we get pseudoductility by different mechanisms, by combining different materials to get fragmentation. In compression, we've also been able to achieve fragmentation and shown a transition in failure from a a, a catastrophic to a more gradual failure and also an increase in the failure strain. And then in impact, energy absorption, we've been able to significantly improve the penetration resistance by designing the material for the particular case to get the best properties. With that, I'll finish. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Time for a question or two. Paul. Thanks, Mike. That's really, really interesting work. One of the things that occurs to me, um, have you tried using a high elongation fiber on the uh, tensile side, like, like a, a Kevlar or Spectra or something like that to support the glass over an even longer deformation? So I think that's a, it's a really interesting point, and I think that would be a, a, an excellent thing to do. In this particular project, we didn't do that, and the reason was because we had one of the criteria we had to, to achieve was to not have any failure on the surfaces. Now, when you put a, a high elongate, so, so material, some of the materials such as uh, uh, Dyneema, for example, mm. wonderful in, in tension, but very poor in compression. So if you have it on the surface, then you'll see damage on the surface. If it's inside the laminate, you might be able to control that, uh, but without having surface damage, which uh, 
our partners did not want to see. The, the, other, the, other, the other thing, just, just to make it more fun even, is have you thought of combining um, a high elongation fibre with your glass, like a, a commingled uh, material in these layers? Because that, that produces quite a significant so we haven't Benefit. done that. That would be quite interesting. It's we've difficult been, getting hold of the commingled fibres. Yeah, it? so in this case here, we've just been using different prepregs, different... Uh, um, that would be an interesting thing to look at. But I think, to me, that one of the key things of this is it's very complex. This is a largely experimental-driven programme. We did do some modelling, but it proven to be very uh, challenging. And we have a PhD student at the moment working on trying to develop models so we can actually, uh, actually design these materials uh, without the need for a lot of trial and error key challenge. Um, yes, yeah, Steve Eichhorn here. Sorry, Michael, one of your colleagues asking you a question. <laughs> but um, one of the ways to find out what your colleagues are doing is come to the meeting. Um, now, you, you mentioned about the fragmentation and the, uh, the increase in the energy absorption. But have you, have you looked at the fragment lengths and the number of fragments to see what state the fragmentation is in, whether you've reached saturation or not, or whether there's some scope to go any further with fragmentation in order to achieve what you're trying to do. Because you're opening up surface area, yeah. you're converting energy to surface energy. So I just wondered whether you've actually gone as far as you could go with a... So what actually happens is that... Uh, so th this is actually a, an angle ply, but it's very similar to a, to a hybrid. So at this point here, when you get this knee, that's when the fragmentation starts to develop. And as you go along this plateau, the fragments are developing, and, and we have measured the fragment density, and you get more and more fragments occurring until you reach a saturation. And when you've got a fully saturated fragmentation, in the same way as you do with a single fiber fragmentation test, it's the same thing at a different structural level, then it becomes saturated, and then you start to see an increase in the, in the stress again. So we have measured these. They depend on the ply thickness, and there's a lot of good work been done on that, um, which we're very happy to discuss. Yeah, thank you. So if we could just go to a final question, and then we'll uh, continue to the next speaker. Um, thank you. Very nice uh, and interesting talk. I was wondering if you have tried, for example, to um, integrate some functional groups in between the layers, like coming from molecular background, I was thinking if you have more interactions, then possibly you can increase the mechanical uh, stress resistance, for example, of these materials, when they will be more integrated by some chemical bonding, like non-covalent but supramolecular bonding. Like between, between, for example, carbon and glass, if there are some functional groups which can interact, they can possibly um, increase the stress resistance of these kind of composites. So I think it, it's interesting. It's not something we've looked at. I think one of the, the key things which we want to understand from the modeling is what actually do we want in terms of, the, for example, if we're looking at interfacial behavior between the carbon and glass, do we want a good bond? Do we not want a good bond? And I think at the, at the moment, it's not really very clear what the best configurations are. So I think we've got some bit more work to do with the modeling to, to really understand that so then we can specify what we'd like and then we can see how we can actually achieve that by, by using bespoke materials. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank <laughs>
Um, the UK is looking into building their own uh, launch pads, uh, especially up in Scotland. Um, and in terms of kind of Ariane space, what they're really trying to do is to replace some of these legacy structures that you can see on an Ariane 5 with more high performance composite materials. And of course, um, this application is kind of like right the, the, the bread and butter of composite materials. We need high performance materials that are lightweight in order to maximize the payload that we can carry up uh, into space. Now that's kind of like the material side, then there's the, the, ge the geometry and the structural side, is um, that if you try to kind of minimize mass in terms of these cylindrical structures, what that means is that you're gonna really be reducing the wall thickness, trying to make things as thin as possible, and that that means that um, specifically as these launch vehicles take off from the launch pad, and as they're placed into compression with lots and lots of fuel in the fuel tanks, that these sections just st basically start to buckle, and that is uh, the, the dominant failure modes, um, mode of these structures. Now, oh, that's quite, quite a small <laughs> font size there. Um, now, one of the, the, the biggest headaches over the last couple of years um, has been, or in, in, in general, is that uh, these structures are very, very sensitive to any form of kind of geometric imperfection. So even if you have an undulation in your wall, a fraction of the wall thickness, that means you can dramatically reduce uh, the expected buckling load uh, of these structures. And um, what we wanted to do in, the, in this project um, with the European Space Agency is to see if we can use toasted composites to uh, make launch vehicle structures a little bit more robust, a little bit less sensitive to these imperfections, and also to prove to the European Space Agency that the, the rapid toasting process uh, can produce uh, material and structures of space grade quality. Um, so to provide a little bit more of a background of what we tried to do, this is a very, very famous plot in the kind of space structures uh, community. So of course, if you have a kind of thin walled cylinder of some radius, thickness, and length, we can uh, compute analytically what the expected buckling load is. And that's kind of like that horizontal line at the top here. Now, if you do any form of experiment, you will very quickly realize that the cylinder actually never reaches that buckling load, but fails sometimes up to 20% of that expected load. And this horizontal axis here is the radius to thickness ratio. So the further we go to the right, the more slender the cylinder becomes, but also the more lightweight and efficient it becomes. So if we're trying to operate in this range over here, we have this problem that we're kind of uh, operating at 20% of the capacity of a perfect structure. Um, and on top of that, there's this big spread in these buckling loads. So what we try to do is essentially to ask the question, well, can we push up this lower limit a little bit? Can we uh, kind of increase the worst case scenario? But also, can we minimize some of this distribution? So can we shrink the variance that we would expect um, in, in experiments? And the way we did that is with the rapid toe shearing process. So of course, everybody here is familiar with uh, the classic straight fiber laminate. And all that we do with, with toe shearing or variable angle toe composites, as they're sometimes called, is we still have a laminate stack, but now every single layer can have um, a ply where the fiber orientation can be steered in curvilinear trajectories. And this is typically done with some form of robotic head. And this is uh, an example of a single woven toe course um, of the, of the rap rapid toe shearing process. Now, of course, in general, steering gives you kind of extra design freedom. We're no longer restricted to straight fiber pads. We can steer around features. Um, for example, if you're interested in fuselages, you could steer around windows in the fuselage. And you also have the ability to transition between different uh, stacking sequences that might exist uh, across a part. Now, what we were interested in here is in the redistribution of load paths. So generally speaking, when you have a displacement controlled experiment, the load will follow, uh, will follow stiffness. And so by playing around with the fiber distribution, we could tailor which parts of the structure were stiffer than others. And that was, that was really what then enabled us to, to design more uh, robust um, uh, fiber steered uh, uh, structures. Now, just as a kind of example of the two different manufacturing techniques that exist, uh, in the beginning, when people were looking at these variable angle uh, composites, the only thing that was really possible is to use uh, an automated fiber placement ma machine where you, you take a classic AFP process and all you do is you just rotate the head as the head is traversing uh, across a plane. And that essentially puts that toe under bending, allows it to be steered. But the issue with that is that it really limits the steering radii that, that you can achieve. Because at some point, uh, because the inside of the toe is being placed into compression, you get these defects. You get fiber wrinkling on the inside of the inside radius and fiber lift off on the outside. 
The second disadvantage of this is because you effectively, across the, the, the toe, have different uh, steering radii. The outside has a larger steering radius than the inside. It's very, very hard to tessellate individual toes. And so you get gaps and overlaps that can, of course, lead then to, 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 uh, to material failure in these resin pockets. And so at the University of Bristol, um, uh, Eric Kim and others uh, developed the, the uh, continuous toe shearing process, which essentially uh, steers by shearing it shearing a toe continuously. So you can think of that as just grabbing a toe and continuously grabbing it and shearing it bit by bit to then steer um, a reference path. And the advantage of this is that you completely eliminate these defects and you can also tessellate individual toes. And this process, originally termed continuous toe shearing, is now being uh, commercialized by ICOMAT as, as rapid toe shearing. And this is what we then used uh, in this European Space Agency project. Um, now, just to kind of provide a context of some of the analysis we did. So we, we had a cylinder, a radius uh, 600 millimeters and about a meter tall. So it was a considerably large structure. And uh, we performed an optimization study where we tried to optimize the load carrying capacity of this structure. So we tried to optimize, maximize the buckling load. But we, we didn't do this deterministically. We did it in a stochastic optimization framework. So we took a database of existing imperfection signatures that the German Airspace Center, DLR, um, provided um, uh, prides freely on, on, on their webpage. And we embedded this within an optimization process to across this data set of imperfections to try to maximize the worst case scenario in terms of the buckling load. So the way that this, for example, looks is that now we no longer have a single buckling load for our cylinder design we have a probability distribution, a distribution of different buckling loads. And here you, you, you see two different distributions. The first one in this kind of red-orange color is, was our benchmark, the baseline design, which was a straight fiber, eight-ply, quasi-isotropic design. The reason why it's quasi-isotropic is because it's a kind of a well-known literature result that if you have a perfect cylinder, the highest possible buckling load is for a quasi-isotropic. And so that's why that cylinder was chosen. And then we essentially went away and we optimized these fiber distributions to try to maximize a kind of worst case scenario. So the 99.9% .9 reliability load, which is often used by the European Space Agency to, uh, to design their space structures. And so what you will notice in this plot is that the kind of mean, the average buckling load hasn't actually shifted that much. It's only increased by 11%. But what has uh, in, uh, decreased significantly is the variance in the expected buckling load. And that variance then means that you get a 300% increase in the worst case scenario of what you would expect if you manufactured a series of these cylinders. Now, unfortunately, this was a, a year and a half project, so we couldn't actually manufacture tens of, of, of these cylinders. We also didn't have the funds to do so. So what we did is we manufactured one of each, one QI cylinder and one of these uh, uh, rapid toe shear cylinders to uh, demonstrate that our models uh, actually correlate with experiments. And if they do, then we have some confidence that what we see here actually reflects what we would see if we had the money to manufacture tens and tens um, of these cylinders. And so that's basically what we did. So ICOMAT, um, in their uh, clean, room, clean room and labs, manufactured both the straight fiber and the toe steered cylinder. At the time, their process could only deal with 2D deposition, so we deposited both of these cylinders initially flat and then wrap rolled it around a mandrel. It was then cured um, at the NCC. The process has since moved on significantly and we can now also deposit on 3D, uh, 3D surfaces. But it was actually quite surprising how well this, the, the, this process uh, worked out in terms of uh, any defects um, that, that, that we observed. We then end potted these cylinders and tested them, oops, uh, in our lab. Now, unfortunately, my key results slide has been cut out, so I'm basically just going to try to make, uh, make this uh, up you know, as we go along, and you'll just have to trust me that whatever I'm saying are actually the results that we observed. So basically, what we observed in these tests, we did DIC, uh, full structural test uh, at the, in the labs at the BCI, and we got really, really good correlation between our experiments and our uh, numerical predictions. So they were within 3%, so excellent correlation both in terms of the quantitative data in, the, in the, the buckling load and the axial stiffness that we achieved, but also we went deep into the post-buckling regime and we looked at some of the buckling patterns that you would see and we correlated the DIC to the finite elements and, and that all panned out really, really well. Um, now, um, one of the kind of fascinating things about these structures is that this structure overall weighs around a kilogram, 
but the failure load is actually 17 tons. So it can take a significant multiple of its own weight in terms of, uh, in terms of axial compression. Now, in terms of future work, um, we were really chuffed that this, that, that cylinder here, so you can actually see one of the test specimens, was nominated for an innovation award at, at JEC in 2020-22. Um, and um, this has now led on this kind of convinced ESA that uh, the RTS process can, can manufacture space grade quality components. And this has now, now led to a follow on project where ICOMAT are working with a prime contractor uh, in Germany to actually uh, manufacture a real space structure. And they're doing further tests in terms of um, permeability with, uh, with hydrogen, for example. Um, and also, as I alluded to before, depositing onto a, a 3D tool. And um, really looking forward to how that um, project um, kind of develops over the future. Now, if you want to know a little bit more about this project, the European Space Agency actually did a write-up on their webpage. So if you scan this QR code on your, um, on your uh, smartphone, that should take you to the, um, the webpage or the, the article that the European Space Agency published. And with that, with that I'll, th I'll thank um, you all for, for listening. And again, thanks to... Reese, who did uh, actually most of the uh, analytical work, and of course my collaborators Alberto and Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reina. Do we have time for one or two quick questions? Because we are just uh, now encroaching on our, our lunch time on the, the agenda, and I don't want to shortchange Phil for our, our final talk as well. Hi, thanks. That was a, an interesting presentation, and the results look very good. I was just wondering, what's the manufacturing time for the <coughs> Rapid2 shearing versus something like the AFP? Um, so, I mean, the, the deposition rate is, is uh, very, very similar. Okay. So it's, it's not like you're getting an order of magnitude reduction. It's very similar in terms of uh, the manufacturing times. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Hi, um, did you consider any uncertainty in the fiber orientation or material properties in your uh, simulations at all? Yeah, so those actually were not uh, considered. Um, and there's a good reason for that, just because the uncertainty in this instance is largely driven by any geometric imperfection. So they do account for a couple of percent, but the uncertainty with regards to the, the, the manufacturing signature and the, any undulation that you have drowns out any of the other uncertainty. And so we, we didn't actually consider that, but that, that is definitely possible to, to include that as well, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's thank Rainer again and move on to our final speaker. <laughs> so our last talk today, um, it comes from a, a NCC speaker, uh, Phil Druff. Um, so over to you, Phil. Um, yeah, I'm well aware that I'm standing between you and lunch, so I'll be as quick as I can. Uh, I'm Phil Drew. I'm, I'm a research engineer at the National Composite Centre, uh, and I've just finished a full NGD with the IDC, which I can thoroughly recommend. Um, but today I'm going to talk about quite a nice uh, core project, as we say, uh, which concluded in July this year, um, and looking at two companies which by now need no introduction, uh, both spin-offs from University of Bristol, so that's ICOMAT, which has had a very good introduction in the previous talk, and also LINEAT. There we are. So, introducing the problem. Um, fortunately, half my introduction has been done for me by Rainer. Um, but essentially, we know next generation components, particularly for aerospace, uh, are going to need to be lighter, more efficient, and that means more complex load paths uh, and more complex fiber orientations to carry those loads. Um, but also, mixing in with that, is very much the need for sustainability. Um, and steering has already been uh, introduced in the past talk for automated layup techniques. If you've got a complex load path, that means introducing steering. So as Rainer said, uh, if you want to steer your toes for any kind of 3D or 2D geometry, that means the outer edge of your toe is gonna travel a longer distance than the inner, inner edge of your toe, uh, and that results in you know, a shear. Um, and if you can't shear the material because it's too stiff, then you get defects, and, and that simply is, is not acceptable. Um, and so the idea of this project is to start looking towards how we can solve this, this issue um, with a sustainable solution. 
Um, and the first aspect is we know, again, rapid toe shearing, ICOMAT, are very, very good at steering, so we want to demonstrate that. Um, but also, um, there's a theory that uh, aligned short fiber recycled materials, such as those produced by Lineat, um, should have a, a slightly lower resistance to that, that 2D shear uh, than a continuous carbon fiber uh, a tape or toe would do. Um, so the idea is here is we want to, uh, first of all, prove that we can lay recycled short fiber material using an automated layout process, uh, an industrial process as well. And um, we want to, to investigate, can we actually improve the steering performance of this material and open up this material for use um, for components that are perhaps more complex than we would uh, would be able to lay otherwise. Um, and so, again, I'm not going to go too in-depth into the process, but essentially Lineat take material, uh, which is reclaimed from industrial waste that looks like this, chopped to very short lengths, in this case, 4 mil, um, and turn it into an aligned, uh, and that's quite, quite key for properties, so aligned unidirectional tape, which is uh, then pre-pregged. And we can then load this into our automated tape layout machine. Um, and then, again, for this uh, study, we wanted to baseline it against a so of an industry standard material, so we chose uh, an 855-2 resin, uh, which is, uh, I guess, quite a, a classic choice here. Ooh, got a point there. Um, and so very briefly, uh, we wanted to, to set up our sort of experimental design, if you like, uh, and choose the radio we're going to use. Um, and the process we chose was automated tape layup, which uh, lays, in our case, 75 mil tapes which are quite wide, um, and you typically wouldn't want to steer with that material at all, really. It's all geared for low cost and high rate. Um, and so from literature, we had to sort of extrapolate quite significantly to look at sort of the possibilities of can we steer this material, which is going to be, as I say, 75 mil compared to below 10 mil, which would be sort of typical for AFP. Um, so we came up with a, a rosette, you know, a, a degree of, or an array of steering um, for ATL. Um, and then we're sort of comparing it to previous results from AFP, which is much thinner width, uh, higher steering capability, but with the higher cost associated. Uh, and also, very importantly, demonstrate the rapid toe shearing process. Um, and again, we're sort of crossing everything over at an, a 0.8 meter radius, um, but the rapid toe shearing, based on ICOMAT's experience, we're expecting to go much, much lower, down to uh, 200 mil, which is a, a really tight corner for this, this type of material. Uh, and so, long story short, again, I'm not going to dwell too much on this, um, but we put the baseline material through ICOMAT's rapid toe shearing process, and very much as expected, uh, they were able to produce quite significant steering um, with very little to no manufacturing defects. You know, you, you really can't see anything wrong with that, so that's sort of a, a five out of five on our, our defect scale, really, visually. Um, but the next test is, is much sort of a bigger question is can we, and I believe this is for the first time, put a recycled short fiber material through the RTS process. So that's the first time we'd, we'd put a, a recycled short fiber material through an industrial um, automated tape layer technique. Um, and again, it is, you know, it's quite a boring slide really because it was very, very successful. And you can see, you know, if, you, if you know the ATL or AFP process, these curves are, are not possible using industry standard machines. Um, and we were able to do this, or ICOMAT were able to do this with an aligned short fiber material um, with, with quite a high degree of success. Um, we saw some very minor, uh, I would say, features. They wouldn't really uh, hit on the defect scale that we expect for typically uh, for aerospace. Um, but nevertheless, we're, we're sort of working on uh, slight shear wrinkles due to the low tensions needed um, and a little bit of dry fiber fuzz, which I think Lenny are already well on the way to eliminating. So it was a very, very good result. And, it, and again, sort of the first of its kind. Um, and uh, just to sort of quantify this, we know visually you can see from the pictures there's no defects. Um, but we did also measure, um, which is something we do uh, at the NCC, measure the, the volume of wrinkles um, using a, a, a method called peak and valley volume measure, measurement. Um, but again, long story short, it's the difference between an infinite radius, so you know, a straight line, uh, and a very, very sharp 200 mil radius uh, is fairly negligible for both the baseline and the aft material. So uh, yeah, it, it steered much better than we were expecting, uh, and it's a, a really good result here. Um, but the next question is, uh, we've done it using ICOMAT's RTS process, but can we show any benefit for the recycled material using, an, uh, I guess, a, a, a process that's used in aerospace automated tape layup? Um, and so in this case, again, we put some baseline 8552 in our electro-impact automated tape layup machine, um, and we decided to uh, uh, lay, uh, as we decided before, a series of tapes. Um, and now, as you can probably tell from the picture, 
Um, this process is very good at laying straight paths at quite high rate, um, but as soon as you go below an eight meter radius, the quality becomes, even visually from that picture, unacceptable. You've got a lot of wrinkling in the final third here, and then anything below it six meters is, uh, is sort of a miracle that even came out of the machine, really. This is a really bad quality. Um, but there's a reason we did all this, and I'm gonna show you in the, the next two slides uh, why that is the case. And again, sort of, this material is quite hard to take photographs of, so here's a bit of a close-up. You can see even at eight meters, you're getting a bit of folding. Uh, this, you know, carbon fiber is quite stiff. It really doesn't like shearing when you've got it in a wide tape format. But what we're looking for is, can we do this with a recycled material, um, particularly because of the short fibers? Um, and we started off doing some um, straight panel tests. Again, I'm not gonna go into too much detail on this, so I'm happy to talk about it if you ask afterwards. Uh, we had a few issues with it, it breaking in the head, so we had to do some things to lower the tension. Um, this is sort of a, a side image or our ATL roller, by the way, and a, a heater which applies the tack. Um, in this case, we switched to a shoe, so the machine has both a roller. Uh, this can then slide out, and we've got a compaction shoe, which is similar to what I come out use. And um, we use the shoe for this, and we, we managed to improve the quality quite a bit. Um, but what you want to see here, and you know, the uh, the important image is the uh, the steering profile. And so, if you have the previous image in your mind, this is a completely different story. Um, and I think I'll put on the three trials we did um, to be fair about it. So uh, again, out of three trials, we did all three trials. And again, at eight meters and six meters, the baseline material was, you know, we would describe as unacceptable quality, far too many wrinkles. The quality is, is dramatically improved. You know, there's an order of magnitude improvement in quality. And even down to two meters um, visually, and I'll show the, the I guess, the, the roughness uh, or the peak and value volume data just to show we're not uh, hiding anything. Um, very good, sort of, no defects, very smooth, uh, very good quality. Um, and then in two out of three of the, the trials, we actually got even down to 800 mil, which is lower than we would for AFP, which is a much thinner toe. Um, and so this is, again, really good result, and I want this picture to sort of stick in your minds, really, is the, the end result of this project. Um, and we are planning to take this further and, and use this information to, uh, to design and make, uh, hopefully, a demonstrator component of some kind. Um, but again, just to sort of show the numerical results, again, pictures you know, might not tell the whole story. So if we measure, again, we call it the peak and value volume. Essentially, this is just volumetric measure of the wrinkles or how much wrinkles we've got. Ideally, everything would be zero. So that's sort of a, a mill pond, flat plane. You can see the baseline, even you know, if you go from a straight line to eight meters and then up to six meters, you're really starting to increase the amount of wrinkles up to quite a high level. Uh, and if you compare it to the, uh, the short fiber material, Interestingly, it was a bit flatter on the top surface, even at a flat, flat plate. Um, but you can see there's no clear trend, which, uh, which sort of shows we're not increasing the amount of wrinkles we produce as we reduce the steering radius. So um, yeah, that was sort of quite a brief introduction to the project, but if I can bring it all into uh, sort of a conclusion slide here. Uh, and this is the sort of chart that we would feed into our computer-aided manufacturing engineers to see what components could we program with each material and process combination. So as you've seen, the ATL baseline, you don't really want to go any, any narrower than seven meters, which means you know, you're limited to quite simplified geometry, um, which is fine for now because it's a high rate, you know, simplified, low cost process. Um, but interestingly, if you switch to your aligned short fiber material, you can then get the benefits of this high rate, lower cost process. Um, but you're also in the AFP sphere now, so you can do much more complex components. Um, and again, that's something that hopefully we'll demonstrate this year, um, but it's something that you know, could really unlock the, the potential of these sustainable materials to be even better than baseline materials in some aspects. Um, and of course, I can't uh, fail to mention that, and that, again, another massive step change with rapid toe shearing. Um, and again, you know, I, I'm not uh, cheaping out on it, but we've just had a whole presentation on the benefits of this. Um, it's definitely worth looking at. And uh, it's something, again, we've demonstrated it can work with recycled material, um, which we thought could have been a bit of a challenge. So overall, that's a really good result. Um, again, this is the final slide. Um, I just wanna, again, this is probably the, the image I want to leave you with. Um, picture tells a thousand words, but this is sort of just the, the massive step change in quality, really, you get when you switch to a short fiber material. Um, and I think um, that's where I'm gonna leave it. Um, Again, I don't want to get you in the way of the sandwiches. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, please ask.
Thank you, Phil. So do we have any questions? Ole. Very nice presentation, Phil, and it's not really a question, more a comment. Going back to, to the, uh, the, 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 the welcome speeches and, and, and Matt Scott's pr presentation where he linked up the TRL scales. So, so precursor to this project, of course, uh, was, uh, you mentioned it yourself, Lineat and Alchemat coming out from low TRL. I would also just mention that, that the, the combination of the rapid toe sharing pro uh, technology and the, and the hybrid project, uh, hybrid, hybrid technology, also was the subject of a, of a lower TRL study uh, project in the, uh, in the Simcom manufacturing hub, which, which uh, I guess have, have been inspiring for this as well, where they actually did manage to, to manufacture a, a quite complex, doubly curved, uh, I think it was a rugby ball uh, shape, defect free as well. So just joining up the dots, they just go from low TRL to now industrial uptake. Yeah, thanks very much. And we learned a few of the lessons from that project as well. So yeah, thanks for introducing that. Yeah, it's well worth a look. Do we have any last questions before lunch? Yee. Hi, uh, my name is Yi Wang, come from BCI. I just got a question like, uh, I suppose, I mean, this result is quite impressive. I just wonder the results maybe highly depends on material itself. Like if you got short fibers, like uh, when you do the AIP under steering, under tension, whether the fiber will be pull out, I mean, that's creating some like, uh, I mean, on dis on uniform distributed of fibers and uh, some maybe rather like rich regions in the final part. So is there like uh, any phenomenon you observe during the process? Um, yeah, I, I think, yeah, I think I know how to answer that. So yeah, there was one part of this project, again, we're hopefully continuing, which is to, to measure the fiber alignment. So I think that's what you're alluding to is you know, we want to be able to steer, but we want to also want to make sure the short fibers are following the path. Um, so that's something we have the capability to do. I don't have the numbers right now, but it's something that we're going to be looking in. Um, and again, visually, um, you know, we've observed the, the, the fiber lines and they look like they're aligned, um, but that's something we're working on. I guess the second question about resin-rich areas, um, again, is a sort of a material quality um, parameter. I don't want to um, lead too much into to next year's project. Um, but again, you know, that, that sort of uh, VF analysis and structural test is something that we're looking at um, um, next year. So sorry, I can't really answer directly, but thank you for the, for the suggestion. Okay, so let's thank Phil and also all of our speakers from this session. <laughs>
I do most of the composites that we do at Vertical. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the company because they're quite a new company. You might not know what we do and who we are. Um, and then I will talk a little bit about how we need to use composites to, um, uh, to do what we need to do at Vertical Aerospace. Uh, so I think we've got about half an hour. Is that right? Is that with questions or? Yeah, so I'll, I'll try to keep it to about 25 minutes. So see, maybe it'll be quicker. Uh, so what we do at Vertical Aerospace is we make electric, vertical and takeoff landing vehicles which is eVTOL. So they take off vertically and they also land vertically, but they can also take off conventionally as well. And there's a lot of discussion about why we've got here with eVTOLs. So the way we try to explain it is, if you look at the computers here, and if you look, look down here, that's an early Mac computer, and look at how it's evolved in the future. Um, you know, this is what we get today. It's much slicker, it's got much higher processing power. And it's the same with these vans. So a lot of people um, have these uh, camper vans from Volkswagen. And you might notice now that they have changed to an electric version, which is this kind of, it's still got the style of this van, but it is, um, you know, it, it's much more advanced when it comes to technology and it's electrical as well. So it's, it's really clean for the environment. And why we see VTOL is a similar sort of accelerated Darwinism. Um, it's looking at the next generation of vertical takeoff um, vehicles. So you've got the traditional helicopter here, which will still have its place in where we go, but also it's not energy, it's not environmentally friendly. What this, um, what this vehicle up here does is it's environmentally friendly, it has zero carbon, and it really is looking at how we will sustain the world going, future, uh, going forward. So with urban air mobility, and this is where this aircraft fits in, um, we're really looking at how we can fly people around, how we can transport people, taking care of the environment and looking at zero carbon emissions. So if you look at what analysts say, they predict that this type of um, this type of vehicle this industry potentially could be a trillion dollar market so there are a lot of people trying to do this at the moment if you look and google ev toll you'll get hundreds and hundreds of companies that are trying to do this and um, we <laughs> a lot of people are trying to make a flying car and it looks like the way the air airworthiness regulators are going is they're not looking at flying cars here. They're going to look at aeroplanes. And this is where we think at Vertical we have our kind of edge. We have got a real mix of people. We've got people from Dyson. We've got people from the car industry. We've got people from more, more traditional aerospace and defence. We've really got a sort of mix of people working on this. But the one key thing um, that gives us our edge, which is when I talk to our customers, I say, why, why are you choosing Vertical? it's the way that we're going to certify it. So because we have aerospace engineers there, we understand what needs to be done to get this certified as an aeroplane. Um, but these vehicles really are aimed at not the long um, uh, transatlantic flights. So the, the theory with this type of aircraft is that you will go from JFK to London Heathrow. You'll then get on one of these vehicles and travel from Heathrow to Canary Wharf. It could cut the travel time from an hour and 50 minutes to maybe 20 or 30 minutes. And the great thing about it, again, is that it is uh, net carbon, it's carbon zero emissions, and it really makes use of a bit of space that's not on the road and not where the airliners fly, which allows the space for these types of vehicles to operate. Um, People say to me, oh, is it just for the super rich? The point of these is not just for the super rich. We really are working to try to get this sort of, um, the charge of these things down, and we're looking to make it available for everyone. So in lots of ways, we're looking at the, the business models and how we make these um, available for all. So um, there's, there's a lot of work as well as looking um, at how we're gonna make it affordable. I will be honest. 
originally in the first ones are probably going to be for the super rich. And certainly a lot of our customers are looking at it for the super rich. But. So who are we in vertical aerospace? As I said, we are based in Bristol. We're, our main headquarters are in Bristol. Um, and we have offices in London. Uh, we have a flight test centre in Kemble, which is in Gloucestershire, where we do all our flight testing. Um, and um, there's about 300 employees now at Vertical Aerospace. It's grown a lot in the last uh, sort of six years or so. I mean, it's grown a lot in the last four years that I've worked for there. So there's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of interesting things that we do, and there's a lot of there's a lot of things you don't see necessarily if you worked for a bigger OEM because we do everything here. We do everything in Bristol in the UK. Uh, so the pictures you're seeing here are mainly taken actually at one of our partner facilities, GKN uh, Global Technology Centre, which is in Filton, which is the area where we use to build our prototype aircraft. So you can see here some pictures of the um, original uh, prototype that we built last year. Um, so a little bit of uh, kind of uh, company history here. Originally, the company was started by a guy called Stephen Fitzpatrick. Uh, Stephen is the owner of Ovo Energy, which is one of the biggest energy companies in the UK. He has real kind of passion about sustainability and trying to, uh, you know, protect the environment, which is why he started Ovo. He came up with the idea of vertical when he, he's a massive F1 fan. And um, when he was waiting to get to the San Paolo Grand Prix, it took him about a couple of hours to get, I think it was about 12 miles down the road. And in that car journey, he thought there must be a better way for us to do this, which is what kind of sparked his interest in, um, in, in how to get something that flies similar to a car, but, um, but is, is uh, carbon free. So he started Vertical Aerospace in 2016. It was about six engineers. And what they did there uh, is they produced their first concept. So this one here, which is the proof of concept vehicle, which flew in 2017 with a CA certification to fly. Um, they, they, six of them produced this together. Uh, they did everything themselves from design to build and flight as well. And um, they, they managed to, as I said, get it certified to fly from CAA, so they got a permit to fly from there. And this was really to prove the concept of vertical sort of vehicles and whether they could fly or not. Um, then they moved on to a larger aircraft in 2019. This was produced by about 30 engineers. And this one here, which is the VX2, which in theory could take two passengers. I wouldn't want to fly in it personally, but it, it, it could take two passengers if we needed to. Um, it was built to show that it could um, have redundancy. So it had six motors on it to show that this type of vehicle could fly, and if one motor failed, it would carry on flying. Then, from 2019, after it flew, we moved on several steps, and we started looking at what could go to market. What type of aircraft are we looking at that we could sell to, um, the, to airlines and the general public? And we came up with the start of the VX4. So the VX4 is an aircraft that uh, is capable of taking four passengers and a pilot. Um, we started to design it in 2020, um, and it was built uh, in 2021, and 2022 it did its first flight. Um, it did a piloted tethered hop, and it did unpiloted um, uh, sort of forward flight as well. So, mm, here we go. As, as a company, uh, we have actually sold a lot of these. So we've actually sold 1,500 aircraft to some really good airlines. If you look at the list of the airlines that have bought them here, we've got companies like Virgin Atlantic, uh, Gold, Japan Airlines, uh, AirAsia, um, and American. We have sold these to some really like well-established um, airlines. And these aircraft are going to be very flexible. Uh, originally, they'll be looking at carrying four passengers and their luggage. But later on, we'll be looking at maybe how we can use them for medivac and transporting patients around the country if needed. 
uh, and also for freight as well. So one of the things that uh, I sort of have to consider is how can I make a cabin that's really flexible and we're really looking at modular cabin design as well. So there's lots of uses for these aircraft. One of the things that we do not want it to be used for is as a weapon because this is not the use. We would give it to the military to use for medivac or to transport supplies, but certainly we wouldn't want this to be weaponized. Um, so this is the uh, VX4. This is our um, concept vehicle that we're gonna take to certification. You can see from it, it's got four rotors at the front, um, which are tilt rotors. So these four rotors are capable of doing the vertical takeoff, but they also can fly conventionally. So this aircraft can fly both vertically and conventionally. If you ask me why it goes conventionally as well, it's to do with battery power. So there's a significant amount of power you need to get one of these types of vehicles off the ground and flying vertically. And if we only flew vertically, you'd only get eight minutes of flight, which is no good for anyone. So we have looked at, and that's why we've got the wings in there. So this will be capable of taking off and landing conventionally if we needed it to. And it's also capable of flying conventionally as well and doing a wingborne flight, which saves a lot of batteries. The four rotors at the back, they are stowed during flight or conventional flight, and they are purely there for the um, vertical takeoff and landing purposes. The aircraft itself, like I said, is capable of taking four passengers and their luggage and also a pilot. The reason for the pilot is lots of people don't like to fly in things that haven't got a pilot. So um, we have still put in um, uh, provision for the pilot and they will be piloted. Um, the uh, flight controls and everything have been done by a company called Honeywell, who've got a lot of experience and real good aer aerospace pedigree and doing flight control laws. Uh, we have got certain partners that we're working with who are helping us make the airframe and also producing motors and, um, uh, um, uh, uh, and other bits of the aircraft. Um, some of the things that we keep in-house are the batteries and the, the propellers, uh, which we'll talk about a bit later. Um, but generally, we, we've gone for a slightly different business model. So some of the really big players in this market are companies like Lilium, Joby, Archer, Aerospace as well. They've gone for a very different philosophy from us. They've gone for a strategy where they're going to make everything themselves. We've gone for more of a partnership approach. So, uh, for example, for Airframe, I have partners in GKN who are looking at the wing design and manufacture, and Leonardo Aerostructures who are looking at the fuselage design and um, manufacture. So, as I said, this, ca this aircraft is going to be capable of taking five people, one of which is a pilot. It will do a cruise speed of about 150 miles per hour. Um, it's got a range of about 100 miles. A lot of this is driven by the batteries and the battery technology. Um, so if we get better batteries, we'll be able to go f further. Um, and then the other thing that's really important about them is if, if you've ever stood there and a helicopter's gone over you, they're really, really noisy. We are really trying to work on getting these almost silent, really, really quiet. Um, and that's a lot of work that's going on on the props to do that. Um, the size of the aircraft itself, it's about, it's about 13, 14 metres long and the wingspan's about 15 metres. The reason for that is that we are looking at the infrastructure and how we actually move around to do this, um, uh, to, to get these aircraft in the air. And a re uh, to start off with, we would want to use the in infrastructure that, that exists already. So um, they're, they're basically built to fit on helicopters, landing pads. Um, and, and I could keep going on about it. The, the, it will have zero carbon emissions. So talk about the proprietary information that we're keeping in house. Some of the real key things are aircraft design. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about the, the challenges with aircraft design um, later. Uh, and then the silent propellers. Propellers are really, really hard to design for these types of things because you want them to be impact resistant, you want them to be quiet, you want them to be lightweight and really, really efficient. Lots of these things don't go together. So there's a lot of work that we're doing on the propellers and the propeller design and shape. 
And then the other thing is, is energy storage. So with all of these things, it's going to be like the cars. Your batteries are going to make or break the vehicle. And so we have kept a lot of um, uh, the battery development and chemistry in-house. In we have uh, an energy centre in Avonmouth that is purely fixed uh, looking at how we manufacture and produce these batteries. So there's a lot of work going on there with energy storage. Uh, we also, and I keep going back to, we know how to sign off aircraft with the authorities. And we actually uh, were the first eVTOL company to get a DOA from the Civil Aviation Authority. Um, and we got it last year. Um, so we have got the authority now to sign off some of our own work. We're still working to get a full certification level DOA, but um, we have got this approval. We're also working with EASA, which is the European aerospace authorities, uh, the Japanese authorities, and the FAA as well, to really try to establish what sort of certification basis we need for this type of vehicle. So this is the prototype that we made last year. It flew last year, made that from scratch, and we made and designed that in about 15 months. Now, I'm from a very big OEM, I used to work for Airbus, and for me to say that I built an aircraft from nothing in 15 months is pretty unheard of. But we, we, did, do, um, we, we did do that, and I know that because I was there. And it flew its first sort of tether tops um, in 2021, and then it flew, um, no, sorry, tether top was last year in 2022, and then it did a lot of flying in the summer this year where we did some forward thrust. Uh, so the aircraft itself, it did 18 flights. It reached a speed of 40 knots. It um, took, uh, you know, we, we, we managed to draw power of one megawatt from it, which is quite significant. And we monitored 20,000 different parameters. We're still going through the data. Um, and we collected so much data that, like, like I said, it's kept us busy for months and months and months. Um, and it flew at Kemble Airfield, which is just in Gloucestershire. Uh, a lot of the sort of forward flight was done uncrewed because we, we needed to do some modifications to be able to get the crash winners ready so we could then put a pilot in. Unfortunately, in the end of summer, it came to a sad end and we had a very, very hard landing, um, which we've talked about externally. Um, and what happened was that one of the props, um, which had the secondary bond on, the bond failed and it released the prop which started a cascade of problems, which ended up with a very, very hard, but controlled landing onto the ground. So um, unfortunately, this is not gonna fly again. So if we talk a bit about the challenges for airframe, which is the composites bits that I wanted to talk to you all about. Making these airframe, aircraft, it's all about balance, and I talk a lot about balance. The fact is, is that one of the key things for this type of aircraft is weight. And this is where a lot of the composite development needs to go into. Because when I worked for Airbus, I made a lot of composite parts. And we used to make them a lot in a similar way that we'd make um, a metallic part. And we used to call it black metal because we didn't really take full use of the composite. The fact is with this type of aircraft is that I haven't got the luxury where I can take that sort of extra weight. The weight of the airframe is about 28% of the whole weight of the aircraft, which is really, really, really small. Um, when you've put in batteries, they weigh a lot of weight, you know, they literally weigh a ton in this aircraft. When you put in um, also all the systems, the problem with an electric aircraft is that it needs a lot of wires to go through it to make it work. And wires are really heavy. And what I find is, what I found is that a lot of these um, weights that we've got are non-negotiable. The battery team will go, oh, well, it's got to weigh this much, so there's no negotiation there. And same with the wires. Wires weigh this much, you need this much wire. You know, go do the maths, that's what it's going to weigh. So all the compromise tends to come on the airframe. So this airframe has to have really high performance. So I need it to be able to be predictable. I need it to be as lightweight as possible. I need to make use of the fibers in the right direction in ways that was not done, I'd say, in conventional aircraft. And so that's where a lot of our challenges are. So the prototype that you just saw is a real compromise. It is not weight optimized 
it was pretty heavy, which limited the amount of flying we could do. Um, when we go to CERT, we have to hit very, very high weight targets. So there's a lot of work around that. The other thing about being head of structures at an uh, exciting new um, like green company is that everybody throws their technologies at you. And I've had, like, it's like, literally like being a kid in a sweet shop. You get to see so many cool things. What I have to do, though, is I have to think about, am I going to be able to certify this? And so we could be having these really, really cool kind of fibre steering um, technologies and things like that. But am I going to get an authority to sign it off? And that's one of the considerations I have to make. And I think it's going to be very likely that the first aircraft you see flying away, around will be a compromise because I can't make it as perfectly as I want to. Um, and it might have limited range. It might have limited capability of passengers. But a lot of these things are down to technologies and whether they're certifiable. So there's a real kind of like, it's very easy to get sort of uh, like uh, tempted by all these cool technologies. But you really have to think, am I going to be able to certify it in the time scales? Because time is a really, really hard thing. I said, there's 300 people trying to do, more than 300 people trying to do the same thing as me. I have to be like within the first ones to do this. So there is this time scales that we have to think about. Um, then I go on about certification, but the fact is, is that a lot of people are trying to make a flying car. A car is not the same as an aeroplane. The standards are so different and the val validation and verification you have to do is very, very different. So there's a lot of work there to work with authorities about also helping them. It's a novel type of aircraft. So it's helping them understand what they want to do, and it's helping them um, sort of, you know, write the requirements in a way that's going to be uh, achievable, but also suitable for the safety that we need. Then the other thing we have to think about is the rates. So these things are going to be between uh, Airbus single aisle aircraft, which is targeted, I think, they, they want to push to rate 70 a month at the moment. Uh, they want to then push it out to 100. That's the sort of goal they're going for. With these type of aircraft, we're going to be pushing out more of them. So it's going to be more like a high-end car. So if you think about your um, McLarens, your, your Porsches, the really, really expensive Ferraris, it's going to be more kind of in that rate. So first time, one thing that's really important and what we're looking at for the certification design that we do is true design for manufacture because it's likely that these things are going to have to click together like Lego. And one thing that we find with composites is it's a lot harder to keep these tolerances. So we really have to look at how do we, where do we put the tooling faces, how do we manage these tolerances that we need to do in order to be able to get the parts to fit together really quickly. So rate is a really, really big thing. And then the last thing is sustainability. So again, there is a real balance between sustainability and what the authority is going to accept. But the fact is, is that we're a green company. What's the point of putting in all this effort to do, make a green aircraft if then 20 years later it's going to be buried in some uh, landfill somewhere? We really don't want that. So we really are kind of looking to work with um, companies and, and people to look at how do we make these aircraft more sustainable. And certainly our material partner, who is Solvay, is looking at sustainability as well and how it can be used in this type of industry. So. To summarise, really, from a composites perspective, it is about balance for what we need. But you have to think about all of these things and you know, weigh them out and decide what's the best technology for us to use. So I suspect, as I said, the first ones that I certify will not be completely optimised. I will then look at certifying later to make a more maybe rate-capable optimised version and then we might be looking later of how we make it more rate capable and sustainable as well so it really is about balance and um, choosing the right technologies for what we need for the time and, and the, uh, where we are in our process and that's it so if anyone's got any questions Thank you very much. Really interesting talk. And I'm sure there must be a lot of questions.
Hey, Alison. Uh, many thanks for your presentation. Really interesting. My, my question, and I think it's related to, so I'm from Carbon360 Consult. Um, my question is related to the previous slide where you were talking about um, balance and, and cost and time. I'm just interested to hear your opinion or, or view about what's vertical strategy at the moment about high volumes and high costs. Are, is that something that you, you guys are considering at the moment or you just focus on the short term and then once the certification milestone is, is, is passed, you, you, you then look at, into it? So cost has to come into everything because we can't make a business model that works. Um, so while I'd like to say money is not an object, it, it probably is for the first ones because you've got to remember where we stand is we're, we're trying to sell an unproven technology and a novel type of vehicle. Um, so we have to make it sort of within a certain cost. So we have got targets of what we've given to us our partners about how much we want each component to to be it will change as we go on and certainly once we've proven that this can be made once we've proven that it is sold and being used then we'll have sort of different targets i imagine but yeah, yeah thank you yeah mine's one of uh, a question of legislation because many years ago i was having a discussions with a, a well-known helicopter manufacturer and they were saying that they they were they were keen to change the legislation that would allow these sorts of aircraft to be able to land at an airport at the same time as a as a plane might be taking off or or, or similar times and the problem was that the legislation currently didn't allow that is that still the case or is, is does something need to change in order because if you if you were able to connect airports up, then you wouldn't need to build additional runways at airports because you could go from a small uh, small airport like the one near me, Exeter, to London in one of these aircraft, and then you get on a larger plane and take off. Mm. So I just wondered where, where, where we were in the UK on that. So there's a lot of work that's going on um, with uh, uh, like many different air airports and um, like other, other agencies looking at the infrastructure and how we're going to put in the infrastructure there. From a legislation perspective, I mean, there are rules. You never see a huge A380 take off and then a small, like, uh, like tiny jet following. Uh, you know, and we still will have to, uh, we'll st still have to use those rules because that's just a safety thing, and it, it's, it's making sure that the environment that those, these things take off are, are safe. But the thing is, and the difference is, is that if we are going for a vertical takeoff, then it could be that they could be in a different part of the air car, um, air, airport, and so there'll be an area, you know, similar to like a heliport where, where these things would, would take off. So you might have to take a bus trip. Instead of going to the terminal, you go to the, the eVTOL terminal. And I think that's the way to get around that sort of issue. Um, but yeah, th there is a lot of work to still do on the infrastructure and how these are going to operate with, with all existing aircraft. Fabrizio Scarpa from BCI. Very interesting talk. I guess you are developing a lot of IPs. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh. Okay. Not, not that one. Uh, I guess you're developing a lot of IPs already as a part of really your product. Uh, so, um, are you interested, or are you focused hundred percent really on the on the V4, or is part of also, also your business case to use those IPs also in uh, uh, to other applications? The IP. Yeah. <laughs> I'm. I'm I'm not really sure, to be honest. Like the company strategy is, we keep things like battery, we keep things like props internal, and the reason for that is that that will give us our edge. If we, uh, when we develop these products and they are successful, I imagine that potentially there could be a revenue stream there. Like we could sell our batteries to someone else. I, and I don't think that um, certainly Stephen is, is against us doing things like that. But for me, I'm focused on making these aircraft vertical, whether we take bits of them and sell them to other people. 
I, I imagine we will if they, they're a good revenue stream. If I may jump in a qu with a question of my own. You, you mentioned the sort of, it's a race to, to get to market first and you, 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 you don't have t uh, necessarily the time or capacity for adopting a lot of maybe the m more sort of uh, fancy or cutting edge technologies uh, uh, versus the sort of security of, of being able to certify. At what point do you see there will be a, a role for some of the, the lower, um, to act as a pull for some of the lower TRL research that we at, mm. at the university and uh, the NCC does? Um, I guess it's, it's not V4, it might be V5 or 6. Do you see as a company becoming more engaged and involved um, in, in the R&T sector once you have a, a product to market? Yes, and, and I would really like this to be a platform to almost prove technologies as well. So, good example of low technology things are, are um, um, uh, structural health monitoring. So, there's a really, really cool technologies there. And for this type of aircraft, if you think about the dynamic loading that goes on in it, it's really, really complicated. And we, we don't necessarily know what it's going to do. And to have a really secure way of monitoring the structural health of this aircraft would be really useful. But the problem is, is I can't certify it based on that technology. So what, I'd still have to mandate a lot of inspection, a lot of things like, uh, a lot more of the, um, the, the, the normal ways that we check aircraft. But it could be that we could use certainly our prototypes and maybe the first flying ones to, to be a platform to prove this technology. The only issue I have with it is that it will add weight. And it's this real balance again of whether the weight is worth adding because later on I'll be able to show that it's really worth it and it helps us in lots of ways. So it's really sort of looking at what, we're, what we need, what technologies are there, to solve the answer the questions that we've got, and then whether it's worth the extra weight. So, yeah. Okay, if we make that one final question and then we'll move into the, the panel session. Thank you, very fascinating talk. Um, I was wondering, is there any kind of development or work going on uh, with hydrogen? Because that may be the future, future fuel, <laughs> like, um, <laughs> Yeah, because battery, I don't know how sustainable it is. Uh, yeah, so the camera's off. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so personally, I wouldn't think that this will not have a will not have a hybrid fuel cell. I, I can see this if they want to go longer range. We're really, really sort of um, restricted by battery technology. And the other problem with batteries is they're really heavy. <laughs> Like they are really heavy, and it doesn't you know, add up when you try and fly something. So I think they will be capable of being retrofitted with other fuel systems. And it, could, it may not be hydrogen, it might be SAP, it might be something else. So I would, I, personally, I keep an open mind about that. But if I tow the company line, it's only batteries. So. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so let's thank Alison again. Uh.